I don't know how to do that. There we go. Excuse me, Mayor Evans, your microphone is not working. Sorry, my thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome uh, to the committee of the whole meeting for the Township of Tiny for this day, Wednesday, January 11th, 2023. Uh, just a couple of notes of order. Uh, this meeting will be video recorded and, uh, and, and uh, audio recorded as well. Um, uh, and uh, at this point, I'd like to uh, call on uh, Councillor Holoka, who has a uh, an item to for consideration for the opening. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I didn't want to start the new year off on a uh, negative note, but uh, I think it's incumbent upon us to acknowledge the recent murder of OPP Constable Greg Pierce Gala. I would just like to. Uh, propose that we just take a moment of silence uh, in his honor uh, and then we can proceed with the uh, with the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Holoka. Uh, I'd ask that the um, everybody in attendance and those of you at home, uh, please stand if you can and we'll have a brief moment of silent reflection in the memory of our OPP officer. Thank you for your participation. Please be seated. Thank you, Councillor Holoka. I'll move on now to the exceptions of the agenda. Um, I will make a couple of notes just off the top. Um, under uh, matters for consideration, just uh, no additions or deletions. We're just gonna change the order a little bit. Um, we have two clerks reports, uh, one F2.4 and one F2.5. Uh, that uh, we can anticipate will take more discussion than others. So I'd like to, uh, in the interest of uh, letting people go that are participating in the meeting, um, we'll move those to the end. Uh, so that's the only update I have. Uh, thank you, Madam Clerk. Any further uh, additions, deletions, any changes anybody like to see? We're all good, okay, good. Can I have a motion then, please, to accept the agenda as stated? Forwarded by Deputy Mayor Miskimans. Thank you. Seconded by Councillor Burnell. Thank you. That the agenda of the committee, the whole be of the whole meeting, be accepted as distributed. All those in favor? The matter is carried. Thank you. Okay, um, deputations to the Committee of the Whole. Do we have any open deputations today, uh, Madam Clerk? I'm sorry, Mayor Evans. Um, uh, can you please address Section B, Declaration of Community Interest? Oh, certainly. Yeah, thank you. Certainly my bad. Um, any, uh, anybody, any topics today, Council, that anybody has any uh, need to declare any pecuniary interest? Thank, thank you very much. Sorry, now we can move on to any open deputations. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Evans. Uh, we have no open deputations today. Thank you. And uh, any deputations, uh, 
no, no open deputations. We have a second item there. Deputations, a committee of the whole. Uh, none of those are available are uh, are open as well. I assume. So we'll move on. Uh, we do have on the on the schedule there a report uh, from uh, Jamie Robinson of MHBC. That's scheduled for nine thirty. So uh, I, I we should uh, move forward then uh, into consent items, and we'll jump out when uh, we get to nine thirty. So. The first consent item um, it involves uh, a report from uh, Works Director uh, Leach with regards to a vertical update with our Wybridge Canada Post location, Canada location box. Um, Director Leach, are you available? I certainly am. Thank you, Mayor Evans. Thank you, sir. Um, yeah, the uh, Township of Tiny and, and staff have worked with uh, Canada Post. Uh, to come up with a viable solution for the closing of the actual office in Wybridge. And working with the group, we have established a location. There was uh, There is nine community mailboxes or CMBs that have been installed on Marsh Lane, um, basically Marsh Lane in the corner of Highway 93. So essentially a stone's throw from the, uh, from the old office. And uh, those are installed. Um, we will have to, or they will have to do some further work in the spring. They weren't able to get the concrete pad in, obviously because of weather. So they will be coming back in in the spring and uh, and finalizing that location. But uh, all in all, looks good. Gives good access. They have off-road uh, pull-off capabilities, so it doesn't interfere with traffic. Uh, we looked at interference with different homes in the area, and it, it did not impact anybody. So. We think we've uh, come up with a viable solution and uh, they're in place and they're operational. I drove by there the other day and uh, people were using them. So they're they're working, they're in place and uh, we feel that that's a, a great long-term solution for Canada Post and the residents of Wybridge. Any Thank you, questions? Director Leach. Uh, any questions, comments, Council? Councillor Holoka, please. Um, yes, uh, Director Leach, uh, the lady that uh, is uh, closest to those mailboxes to the east, she's already complained to me that people are pulling into her driveway uh, on a number of occasions during the day. I don't know if, uh, if there's anything that can be done about that to uh, alleviate her anxiety. Uh, through Mayor Evans, um, all I can do is talk to Canada Post and see if they have any things that they do at these locations to prevent it. This location was good because uh, users can just drive right around the block to get back out. There's no need to, to have to turn around. Um, I can follow up with them and indicate that and um, uh, see if they have anything that they recommend in doing that to, uh, to help minimize the impact of that turning around. Any supplemental on that? Yeah, through you, uh, Mayor Evans. Um, what the... Uh... I've witnessed and what she is complaining about is that people aren't driving around the block. They're using her driveway to just pull in and back out and then go back towards uh, Highway 93. So I'll leave that in your hands. And uh, I mean, if we only get one complaint, I guess, uh, you know, we may have to live with that if there's no other uh, suitable location. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Leach, anything? Or, sorry, Director Leach, any further? Uh, nothing further. Thank you. Council? Thank you, Director Leach. Thank you. We'll move on. I believe you have another update for us with regards to the outdoor ice rinks. Yes. Thank you, Mayor Evans. Um, yeah, the outdoor ice rinks, as we, as we all know, the... Uh, the weather hasn't been very cooperative for pretty much any winter sport, whether it's skiing, snowmobiling, or skating. Um, the temperatures have been up and down, significant weather events followed by rain and warm weather, and everything disappears again. I think we experienced a couple of those events through uh, December. Um, that unfortunately has had an impact on our um, our natural ice surfaces. We have three that we do maintain, La Fontaine, uh, Yvel, and uh, Perkinsfield. So we've been uh, looking at this to see what their feasibility and, and looking at almost a cutoff date, uh, which time do we have to say that uh, we're not going to be able to do this um, economically and provide the service that these uh, rinks do. We do recognize this is hugely important for our community. It's a great thing for people to go out and do. It's, it's free. They can go out and play and have fun. It's great for the kids and adults alike. 
Um, so what we're looking at right now is basically we need to have temperatures, uh, nighttime temperatures, minus seven minimum. Uh, we prefer minus eight, minus 10 uh, for a good stretch of, um, you know, five days uh, straight with daytime temperatures of minus two, minus three, just to at least help the ice stay until we can reapply another surface. So we are looking at uh, Perkins Field is our, um, let me call it easiest rink to uh, uh, build and maintain ice. Um, we're looking at hopefully in the first week of February that if weather picks up, we can build that rink up in about three or four days. Um, at that point, if we look at our forecast um, and it doesn't look good, then we'll have to bail on that one. The other two rinks, um, Yvale does not have a roof on it, uh, so it is very vulnerable to uh, a warm and rain. Um, and La Fontaine is a little more difficult to build. So we're kind of looking at the end of this, uh, January, sorry, that um, we'll make an assessment on the two of the three rinks. And then um, in the first week of February, we'll make an assessment on the Perkinsfield rink. And we will put out communications and advise council, staff, and uh, the public accordingly. Uh, but we felt it was uh, with the uh, CAO Lamb and myself discussed this and we felt it was important that we just make the public aware of it. Our goal is always to try and have something open for March break, but Mother Nature has not been very cooperative this winter, unfortunately, uh, for all outdoor sports in the wintertime. So we will keep an eye on it and we'll keep the public posted along with council staff and uh, make sure that everybody's aware of what our direction is. Thank you. Thank you, Director Leach. Council, any questions, comments? Councillor Brunel, please. Yes, through you, uh, Mary Evans, uh, uh, Director Leach, uh, why is uh, La Fontaine more difficult than Perkins Hill to uh, do the ice there? Just, just curious. Yeah, um, we in uh, through Mayor Evans, yes. um, the uh, the surface there. It, it seems to, and we, we're not 100% sure if it's heat from the ground that comes up through it, but it, it's just a little bit more difficult uh, to get ice. Once we get it established, it's good, but getting it established does take a little extra time. Um, so we do struggle a little bit with La Fontaine. Um, once it's there, it's great. Uh, it's just getting it built takes a lot longer and more sustained uh, cold night temperatures and day temperatures in order to make that feasible, safe uh, to operate and open. Councilor Brunel? Great, great thing. Thank you, Tim. No. Thank you, Thank you Director Leach. Um, I'd you. like to also mention, I was going to mention at the end of the meeting, but we do have a winter, the tiny winter festival is taking place in Perkinsfield Saturday, February 13th from 11 till 2. So um, hopefully Mother Nature gives, uh, gives us some cold weather and we can have, uh, have ice for that festival. So any other further comments? Uh, the only other one is we're also working, I, I forgot to mention, with uh, the Recreation Department, Benita, with her programming mm -hmm. uh, to ensure that um, whatever programming impacts this will have, that we are communicating with the Rec Department so that they can advise residents on any programming or activities that they have planned through their um, through their group. So. Thank you, Director Leach. Thank you. Okay. Any, anything further? Sorry, before I move on. Great. Okay. I move on to uh, item F 1.3, a uh, verbal update of our hybrid council meetings uh, that we're working through. And as you can, I'm sure the public can see that we have microphones in front of us. So the, the end is near, hopefully, uh, and we can move on to a multi uh, uh, format uh, display system. So, and uh, hopefully, personally, I'd like to get to, to personal meetings again, in person meetings. So we're moving that way. And, and it's a good sign to see the uh, see the microphones here. So I'll turn this over to uh, Director uh, LeBlanc or, uh, or Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mayor Evans. I'll, I'll start off and, and if Haley has anything to add from a technical standpoint, um, she'll certainly jump in. Um, so as uh, Mayor Evans indicated, uh, we're well on our way to um, setting everything up for our hybrid meetings in preparation for our return to in-person council meetings. Um, so uh, at this point, um, uh, we're just working out the kinks. Uh, we um, are going to be doing a test run with staff uh, early next week. And then what we would like to do is have a, a session with council, uh, a bit of a training session. So that would be a special meeting of council 
um, just to have a training session on the system so that you can see um, what it looks like um, during an actual meeting. If in the event uh, we are in a hybrid situation where a member of council is attending electronically. Um, I don't know, Haley, before I go on with some other points, if you want to talk to anything with regards to the technical issues of the system. Yes, thank you, uh, Sue. Uh, through you, Mayor Evans, to Council. Um, so at this point, really, there uh, there's a little bit more testing to be done, um, and actually the vendor will be on site tomorrow. Um, there has been a slight delay just due to personnel issues, uh, sicknesses, and uh, and other and other items. But um, they will be in tomorrow, so I think we're back on track. Uh, again, as Sue mentioned, training hopefully will happen early next week, and uh, and then slightly after that, we'll um, we'll train council, and then uh, we'll be ready to go live. Great, perfect. Thanks for the update. Um, there is one thing I wanted to mention um, along with the, the hybrid council meetings, uh, just some considerations um, that we just need a little direction from council on. Um, so um, we're looking at um, the deputations and third party presentations in particular. So um, the procedure bylaw does speak, I just want to make a comment, the procedure bylaw does speak to electronic participation of council members during routine periods. So that's all laid out in um, the procedure bylaw. Um, and we'll certainly um, uh, remind council of those items uh, when we get to that point. But with regards to uh, third party presentations, our deputations and such, um, we just need some guidance as to when we return to in-person meetings, um, does council still want to provide the flexibility to anyone attending as a deputation or third party that they could attend electronically if that's more convenient for them? Or um, would it be a situation where that once we're back to in-person meetings, council would like the deputations, third parties to attend in person? So we just, uh, from a quick standpoint, uh, we just would need some direction on that so that we can um, make sure that our policies are in line with council's wishes. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Councilor Woma, please. Yeah. Sorry, space bar didn't work. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, 100% would like to uh, keep the ability for Zoom deputations. Uh, this is a whole uh, accessibility concept. Uh, we do have a, a diverse uh, demographic, permanent residents, cottagers, and uh, I think the ability to uh, tune into your council meeting from wherever you are uh, to voice your concerns and or solutions, preferably the, the latter, uh, is a benefit to everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wama. Further discussion, Deputy Mayor Miskimans, please. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. Um, I fully support Councillor Wama on that as well. We've got to, uh, the world has moved on. We've got great technology nowadays and uh, per accessibility standards as well, I think we need to, to provide options. We know our council chambers here are not very large by any means. So the fact that we can um, have these hybrid options and uh, leveraging technology um, to enable residents wherever they may be to, uh, to provide uh, commentary and um, have their voice heard in the community, I think is essential. So I'm really super excited um, that this technology is going to uh, to be fixed. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, Director LeBlond, um, Clerk Walton, and the rest of the technology team and everybody that's been involved, because I know this has been trying tr to uh, to source parts, um, given the disruptions to the supply chains. And uh, if anybody is, uh, has been in the market for a new car, you know the chip situation um, coming from abroad has been uh, has been trying so it's it's not just uh subject to the to the car manufacturers it's everywhere so thanks for your patience and thanks to the public's patience um for this we will uh, we will get back to it so i'm looking forward to it thanks deputy mayor miskimans thank you council any other further comments councilor Brunel, please yeah i just want to throw my support for what has been said so far also i totally agree with the accessibility part of it for sure Thank you. Councillor Aloka, echo those sentiments? I echo those sentiments. Thank uh, I, you. I do as well. So I, I don't, Madam Clerk, do we need a, you don't need a vote for this or anything, do we? I think you, um, well, you can I take actually, it from her. Yeah, do? sorry. 
Yeah, sorry, Mary Evans. I do have something prepared just in the event. I was prepared, okay. but there's actually just one more thing I wanted to comment on. Um, okay. So with regards to the third party deputations, that's great. Um, so um, I'll, I'll include that in the resolution for council. But also, uh, I just wanted to talk briefly about our advisory committees of council. Um, so you know that um, near the end of uh, last year, uh, last term, it was suggested that um, the uh, committee members be given the option to attend in person if they wanted to, because some members were anxious to get back to that. So um, with the um, hybrid virtual combo, um, I just wanted to get some direction from council as to um, committee member involvement, um, if they're open to allowing that flexibility to our advisory committees as well to attend virtually um, if, if required. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Deputy Mayor Miskimmons, please. Thank you, through you, your worship. Um, I don't see it being a, an issue. I think um, what's good for the goose is good for the gander, is, as they say. So if we're opening this up to third party deputations or reports and council members being able to do this, I don't see why advisory uh, committee members couldn't uh, be afforded the same opportunity and uh, flexibility. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. For the comments, Councillor Walma, please. your worship just a thumbs up thank you um madam clerk's kind of looking over here i just have a question for councillors do you have any other questions comments um are there any implications i know some of these committees that i was on um in the past uh jenna wasn't participating uh in as far as making these available online are there any additional requirements or staffing requirements that we have to be aware of madam clerk um, thank you, Mayor Evans. Uh, with regards to the committees, the, the meetings aren't live streamed. Um, they will be open. Uh, they're always open to the public to attend in person. So that will be a non-issue when uh, we get back to in-person meetings. So um, there, the, there aren't any, um, any further requirements. Um, the meetings have been held through Zoom anyway. So um, having that electronic participation, um, I don't see that being an issue. Okay, fair enough. I think we're all in agreement then that uh, we'll follow the same uh, path that we did with uh, council meetings with the uh, committees of council as well. Through you, Mr. Chair, if I may. Uh, Mr. CIO, please. Yes, thank you. So back to the uh, the question of council meetings, we've talked about deputations and delegations being able to participate. It would be nice to get direction as to whether uh, staff as well at times would be able to participate electronically versus always having to be in the council chambers when we get to council and committee meetings. If we're looking at uh, doing the changes to our rules, I want to make sure we encompass our best practices into those rules as well. Thank you for the comments, CIO Lamb. Councilor Walman, please. Thank you, Worship, through you. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, I think that uh, I, I like uh, Deputy Mayor's analogy, the, the goose and the gander thing. Uh, there's a lot of times we'll have uh, all of our senior management team in this room, and uh, that means that they're they're not doing other things. Uh, the ability to work electronically, especially if they don't have something specific to uh, their department on the agenda, is a, is a benefit to the municipality, uh, as long as, uh, to the CAO's point, they're available for uh, uh, to chime in uh, via Zoom. So I 100% support uh, support that. Obviously, if uh, if we're doing a planning meeting, I want Sean there. But uh, that uh, I'm I'm okay with uh, uh, that uh, the same latitude uh, with uh, staff. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Further comments? Deputy Mayor Nismith, just a thumbs up. Just a thumbs up. I okay. yeah, that's what I meant. Sorry, I should have been more clear in my statement. I think okay. the rules apply to all, regardless role, position, community, everyone. Madam Clerk, is this something, uh, the additional uh, item uh, raised by CIO Lamb that we should include on this recommendation? She's already on it. She's already got it. Good. I'll just throw it out there. Are there any other implications that anybody can think of as we move forward with uh, opening this up, both electronically and in person? I don't believe that there's any other formats that we participate in. We're going to talk about town halls later, but uh, those will be in person. But uh, coming down there. Thank you so much. 
So uh, as a result of the discussions, we have a rec recommendation and I will just briefly run through it. Um, whereas council considered third party presentations, scheduled and open deputations with the eventual return to in-person meetings. And whereas council considered the attendance of advisory committees of council and local boards with the eventual return to in-person meetings. Now, therefore, it is recommended that third party presentations, scheduled and open deputations remain flexible and that requesters can attend in person or through electronic participation as deemed appropriate as per the policy and guidelines of the township and that members of the advisory committees of council and local boards have the flexibility to attend in person or through electronic participation as deemed appropriate and as per the policies and guidelines of the township and that senior management team and necessary staff be afforded the opportunity to attend council and committee of the whole meetings electronically if deemed appropriate. Can I have a mover please? Deputy Mayor Miskimans, seconder. Councillor Wama, all those in favor? The motion is carried, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the discussion. We are right at 928. Madam Clerk, is Jamie in the uh, the waiting room? Uh, Laura, can you confirm? That's correct. Hey, thank you. He's available. I think we're open to begin. As always, the uh, Jamie's presentation, like other presentations, is available online for those of you at home that like to follow along. Mayor Evans, if I may just do an introduction. Please, Director Purcell, I love that. Thank you. Uh, so good morning, members of council. Thanks uh, for the opportunity um, to have uh, Mr. Robinson with us. Uh, just some background, because I know we have uh, new members of council. Uh, Jamie uh, Robinson and MHBC Planning uh, have been involved with the township for some time, um, specifically as it relates to the development, uh, preparation and approval of the township official plan, uh, which, was a, which was adopted by the township in 2018 and approved by the County Simcoe in 2021. And as uh, members of council are probably aware, MHBC Planning, both uh, Jamie Robinson and Wes Crown were also involved um, in the preparation development of the township's new zoning bylaw. Um, so one of the one of the things that uh, MHBC planning does for their clients as well is review new legislation and policies that come down from the provincial level um, to provide updates to their uh, municipal clients. Um, so with that, um, Bill 23 is a big one. Um, and uh, we, we had some discussion at the at the council table um, before um, at the end of the, at the end of 2022. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Jamie to walk us through um, the memo that he's prepared for council today. Um, and then one, one thing that I'm suggesting is maybe at the end of each section of the memo, we can stop there. And if there's any specific questions that council may have, um, and also we can talk about the implications for the township. Thank you, Director Prasad. Jamie, good morning. Welcome. Uh, Thank you for coming in this morning and uh, we look forward to your discussion and uh, look forward to working with you in the future. Some of us have seen you online in other capacities for the township and uh, look forward to working with you as we move forward. Uh, the floor is yours, sir. Take care. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, and uh, thanks for the welcome and good morning, members of council and congratulations to all of you on your uh, your appointments. I do look forward to working with you as well over this term and uh, as Sean mentioned, we have had a chance to work with the township through uh, over a number of years. Um, I will say, I've kind of, as a bit of background, I've been involved or been at the township since I was in diapers, I think. Um, my, uh, my grandfather was the reeve of the township in the 70s and 80s for 18 years. So uh, there's some pictures of me at the township with my brother when we were, uh, were in diapers. So there's a, a long history there as well. So. Uh, in terms of Bill 23, just getting right, right at it, this is a piece of legislation that's, I think, the fourth piece of legislation that's come out of the, the Conservative government related to changes to sort of a land use planning framework in the province. There's a number of pieces of legislation that are changed 
the Planning Act, Development Charges Act, Conservation Authorities Act, and some other pieces as well. We'll really focus here today on the Planning Act changes and, and dive in a little bit to the to the uh, Development Charges Act changes as well. I had prepared the memo, which is part of the agenda package, and I think you all have it in front of you. Are you fine, Sean, and in your worship, if we just speak to that, or would you like that on the screen, or how would, would you prefer to proceed here? Director Prasad, any comments? Um, thanks, uh, Mayor Evans. I, th I think uh, Council has it in front of them. Uh, maybe okay. Package, so maybe we'll just walk through each item. I don't know if it needs to be up on the screen. Okay, that's that works. E, that works. That's well. fine with us. Yep. And we all have it here. I just wondered if anybody at home wants to see it. But um, if anyone's following and has the agenda, it's there's a link or a hyperlink in the agenda package, and you could follow. It. Okay, perfect. Please go ahead. Great. So, in terms of Bill 23, um, it's it was uh, it's been given royal assent, and some pieces of it is, pieces of it have come into effect already. Other pieces of it will come into effect at later dates when it's uh, proclaimed and when regulations come into effect that that, uh, that uh, provide the direction to the res to the uh, the legislation. So the first item I'd like to just review with you is there's a, a section related to inclusionary zoning and affordable and attainable housing. That's something that I think jumps out on a lot of people and this piece of legislation is, the title of it kind of speaks for itself. It's more homes built faster. So they're trying to reduce some red tape, which has been a common theme with the provincial government. As far as the attainable housing piece, that portion of the legislation really has limited or has no applicability to tiny township. As far as attainable housing, Attainable housing, the definition of it is going to specifically apply in areas of major transit areas and areas specifically designated by the province for those sorts of, of uses and that type of housing. So in a rural context or in a rural municipality, uh, there is no applicability to the inclusionary zoning piece of that legislation. So it doesn't really open up any additional doors for affordable or attainable housing for tiny township. Is there any questions on that? Sean said we pause at each section and if there's questions or feedback. Council, any, yes. Councilor Walma, please. Yes, we do have one question, Jamie, thanks. Thanks, Jamie, I appreciate, appreciate the update. Um, just uh, not familiar with CBCs. Uh, they were exempt from development charges, CBCs and parkland dedication. Uh, in CBC, sorry? Yeah, one of the, the line items, it says the, uh, the affordable housing is uh, exempt from DCs and CBCs. Oh. oh, sorry. So CBCs, you'll see it later underneath the development charge heading, That's but that's community benefit charges. Okay, thank so you. The reason you're not familiar with it is the township doesn't currently have or deal with community benefit uh, charges. It's something we see more... Uh, more in urban areas and what it is it's it's it allows municipal it allows developers for example to have a higher density of development if they provide the municipality with a trade-off or something so it could be you can let's say your maximum permitted density is 40 units per hectare you could go to 50 if you provide some public art or if you provide something that benefits the community so in order to to act on those items, municipalities need specific bylaws that provide direction. So we'll get into that. Thank you. Segue into that. But, uh, but again, that doesn't really affect um, affect my township. Any other questions on that piece before we move on? Okay. Thanks so the good. next the next heading deals with parkland. So. Again, a lot of these items are more urban related items than they are rural. So the first bullet point deals with the maximum amount of parkland that can be paid as capped at 10% of the land value uh, for sites under five hectares. So parkland in the Planning Act is paid in a couple of different ways. The way Tiny Township has historically done it is that if someone's creating a new lot or if they're undertaking plant subdivision where you create multiple lots, 
the township's allowed to collect up to 5% of the value of the land the day before it's draft approved as cash in the park land. So for example, if you were creating a new lot and the value of that lot is going to be $100,000, you could effectively collect $5,000 that can be put towards purchasing parkland or um, enhancing parkland within the municipality. So the municipality has a reserve fund that that money goes into, and then they're required to spend that money to purchase parkland or upgrade, put in swing sets or do whatever the case may be, build a ball diamond, build a soccer field, they can use money for those sorts of things. Um, I don't expect the municipality would change the way they currently collect parkland as a result of this, this legislation. Again, what this change is dealing with is there's a separate way to calculate it where you're dealing with developments of over 300 units, which isn't applicable to the township time. So that one really doesn't apply as well. What does apply is the last bullet point that municipalities are required to spend or allocate 60% of their parkland reserve funds at the start of each year. So basically what that means is if you're collecting money, you need to be spending it or have a plan to spend that money. So uh, that's really what that, uh, what that entails. Thank you, Jamie. Councillor Wilma? Thank you, Worship. Through you. Uh, is that uh, on a go forward basis, or if we have parkland reserve funds uh, in existence now, do we have to start uh, spending them? It, um, I have not reviewed, I don't believe the regulations come out on that specifically, but what I expect to be the case is that if you've got funds currently built up, you'd be required to allocate or spend 60% of them. So have a plan. So your parks master plan, for example, could have some details in it, or there could be a, an update to that or a staff report come forward each, de each December of each year that indicates how you plan to spend them next year, that 40% drawdown. It's, it's really a function of the, the money's there and it's, it's collected for, to benefit the community as new development comes on stream and it really should be spent to benefit the community as it comes on the stream. Supplemental uh, follow up. Sure. So it, I'd like to keep an eye on this one. This is just for council and staff, I guess, because we have a lot of master plans that have dollar values attached to them. That if we were spending the minimum amount of parkland reserve that we have come into the community, we wouldn't really be able to bite off any large projects with it. It'd be infill with benches and new slides, maybe kind of thing, instead of the ability to develop any of our parks. And, and through you, Your Worship, to the councillor, what we can look at is what that spend or allocate means. Does it mean you have to allocate to spend it in the next fiscal year? Or do you have to allocate to spend it over the next five years? So there'll be some. And the, the, again, the regulations haven't come out on the specifics of that yet. Good. Thank you, Jamie. Director LeBlanc? Thank you. Uh, just I wanted to address council just regarding this particular point. Um, we will be presenting to council the capital budget uh, on January 25th. And that capital budget, staff do recommend um, what reserves to use to uh, various projects. Yes. So Parkland will be discussed at that meeting. Um, so there is an annual review, uh, essentially, through the capital budget process. Thank you, Haley. Uh, further comments, questions on Parkland? All good. Great, Jamie, please continue. So the next, uh, so council, the next item deals with development charges. The first bullet point really doesn't apply to you because your development charge bylaw was enacted in, um, in 2020. So what development charges are for the new members of council, if you're not familiar, uh, develop, the, the municipality historically every five years, if they wanted to charge development charges, had to undertake a development charge of background study, which what it does is it, it identifies the cost of delivering services or capital costs to the municipality. So it looks at what's the value of your roads, what's the value of your bridges, what's the value of your fleet, um, what's, what's the cost to undertake uh, development or growth related studies with the very high level principle being that new development should pay for new development, that there shouldn't be a burden on existing taxpayers to fund new development. 
that's the overall principle of development charges. So the idea being is if you had one library book for every 10 people and you add additional population, you should continue to have one library book for every 10 people and the new folks that move into the, move into the community should be paying for that. Same thing, if you have one snow plow for every 1,000 people, for example, or every 500 people, you should continue to main that, maintain that same average level of service. So that's the, the principle behind development charges. What these changes are doing are identifying that if you have a new development charges bylaw, there's an automatic 20% reduction. So again, that doesn't apply to you. Your development charge rates, I've, I've looked at them and they're, they're pretty reasonable compared to other, other areas. And, um, and so there's no impact on you with respect to that. What does change is that uh, your, the development charge bylaws currently expire after five years. So there's almost five year updates requiring. Now that legislation is saying every 10 years. So you're not required to update them as often as you were historically. So that's, that's a change. Um, you're no longer allowed to include growth management studies. So historically, you could include the cost of preparing a zoning bylaw, a cost of preparing an official plan update or percentage of those in your development charge calculations where the, the, the province and the legislation is no longer allowing for the collection of those as part of development charges. Sorry, Your Worship, I did see a question there. Uh, Deputy Mayor Miskaman had a question actually. Jamie, thank you. Three, Your Worship, good morning, Jamie. Um, just on that second bullet point, the development charge bylaw expiry, um, does that pertain to ours? You had mentioned uh, just previously that our last one was done in 2020. So does that mean we are grandfathered in until 2030 where it has to uh, be updated or does it now mean five years, which would put it at 2025? No, that's my understanding is it push out to the 10 years. Just as a sort of, as a comparative, Recently, the province did the same thing with official plans. Official plans were required to be updated every five years. They moved it to every 10 years. And it Thank didn't you. mean that older ones had to be updated five years. It meant you could, could go out the 10 years for new official plans. Okay. Good. Um, there's another Good. point similar to the parkland piece that municipalities are required to spend 60% of their DC reserve funds for priority items. So for you folks, that would be roads related items um, within, uh, so they're, they're required to spend that money. So uh, that's typically not an issue for municipalities. There's always road projects and infrastructure projects to undertake each year. So usually at budget time, the treasurer and the public works department will identify what portion of those development charge reserve funds related to roads get allocated each year. And just so council's aware, there's a different reserve fund for every area of service. So there's a roads development charge reserve fund, there's a park land reserve, there's a park reserve fund, there's a, a um, growth and development reserve fund. You might have the names wrong, but there's different funds for each area. So you can't collect funds for park land and use it towards road. It's very specific in terms of how that's managed. Uh, <clears throat> and then finally, there's some opportunities for discounts for development charge reserve funds for rental units. Uh, and there's some opportunities for exemptions for attainable housing. As mentioned previously, attainable housing, the def definition of that term would not apply in tiny township. And how, um, reductions or discounts would be applied for rental housing is to be seen. There's currently no regulation that's been prepared on, on that. Because the idea is that if someone can constructs rental housing, they would get a relief on their DC and provided it's, it's affordable rental housing, they get a relief on their DC payments. Um, but again, there's no regulations on that. So there will be regulations that come out that make sure that that unit has to stay in the rental pool for a certain number of years. It can't be, can't be rented for six months and then somebody turn around and sell it and make a significant profit on it that they wouldn't have otherwise made because of the relief they received from, from the DC. So we're just, we're waiting to see the regulations on that. So uh, it, it could have some, some, 
implications and tiny if someone needs to construct some rental housing. But that was the focus of it is that in need, in times of housing shortage, there should be a, a um, an incentive for, to develop rental housing. Thank you, Jamie. Questions, comments? Jamie, I've got one. In, I'm sorry, Councilor Burnell, please go ahead. This is for you, uh, Mayor Evans. Uh, good morning, Jamie. Um, the discount uh, will be determined by the municipality, I'm assuming. Well, just a question, sorry. Uh, again, it will be a regulation item. The regulation will identify how much of a discount is provided, whether it's a complete discount or whether it's partial payment of the reserve fund, but we don't know yet until the regulation comes out. So it's unfortunate I don't have the answer to some of these questions, but it's the province has identified the legislation, but they haven't yet figured out how it's actually going to unfold. <laughs> so it's like they've given us a playbook without all the plays in it. So, but we'll, uh, so, so we'll wait for that. I guess the, the potential impact on the municipality for some of these items is that in order to under, undertake some of the projects that you have planned, you rely on development charges and some of the funding because you have limited opportunities to generate revenue as a municipality, whether it's through taxation, development charges. So if there's a shortfall because some of the, some uh, folks may be discounted development charges, then to, to either maintain that current level of service or undertake those projects, the funds have to come from somewhere else or the project doesn't get done. So in some instances, it could result in, a, in an additional burden to the taxpayers. So just wanted to make that clear to you. Thanks, Jamie. Anything further, Councillor Burnell? No, good. thank you. Yep. Good. I, I'm not sure, Jamie, I'd like to discuss either now or later at the end of, the, of your presentation, you mentioned a couple times about attainable housing and affordable housing not being applicable to tiny and uh, i'd like to dive into that a little bit more in, in terms of is that a temporary thing or or why are we not uh considered for uh, attainable or affordable housing as we move forward I, I, your worship maybe we can just address it uh, right now so the attainable housing is a new term it's not a term that we've seen before in provincial documents and it's a term that they've developed. So affordable is different. There is a definition in the provincial policy statement for what affordable is. And there's it applies differently if you're dealing with a rental situation or an ownership situation. So in the back of the provincial policy statement, there's a specific definition of what affordable is. So that does apply in tiny townships. So I misspoke if I said that it didn't previously. But as far as attainable, Attainable is the new term, and it's only to be applied in specific areas that are identified by the province. So they'll identify a specific location in a municipality where this affordable, uh, sorry, attainable housing, I get it mixed up, where the attainable housing relief would apply. So okay. areas that, for example, the province and their provincial plans has identified major transit areas or nodes. So those would be areas, for example, where they'd like to see this attainable housing, uh, housing that some some folks may not otherwise be able to afford because it's close to the infrastructure. They can rely on the infrastructure to get around. So they're, mm -hmm. they're trying to create a framework there that makes it uh, uh, more advantageous for folks without transportation to, to get around and afford somewhere and afford somewhere. So, yeah. Okay, great. Thanks, Jamie. I think that clears it up. I know I realized that, you know, the second paragraph on the attainable housing is TBD in terms of the definition, but I'm uh, just curious. Uh, we'll discuss it at the end, obviously, a little bit about how this all pertains to tiny going forward. So any yeah. other further questions? On, on, sorry, we're at development charges. So you can, if you want to just touch briefly on, we'll move on to community benefit charges. Yeah, I won't spend much time on this one, your worship and council. I've prefaced it previously, but it looks like Sean has something to say about it. But again, community benefit uh, charges are a, a way that a municipality could uh, could see increased density or, or modifications to zoning standards in return for something that benefits the public interest, for example, or something that does public good. So, Sean? Sorry, yeah, Mayor, I just, I just want to jump back to that affordable housing piece. 
Sure. Uh, I think what Jamie was kind of getting to is that uh, the definition of affordable housing, um, the, the type of development that we typically see in the township is uh, owner owner built homes, uh, which don't fall into the definition of affordable housing. Um, so they wouldn't be subject to those exemptions. Now that the Development Charges um, Act did change a couple of years ago with regards to additional dwelling units, which is one of the things that we have included in the new zoning bylaw. So where an additional dwelling unit is permitted, uh, an owner is allowed to build two additional units, uh, one in the house and one in an accessory structure. Those types of uh, developments are already exempt in the development charges bylaw in order to encourage that type of development. So that's already something that we have um, in place once our old zoning bylaw is repealed. Um, but the type of affordable housing where you, you know where we typically think of a multi-unit uh, apartment building uh, for rental purposes that may fall into that affordable housing category. Um, we typically have not seen that type of development. One development that may fall into that category is, uh, which has been in front of the previous council, is um, in addition that the La Village Wa development is looking at doing in La Fontaine. That could fall into that category, but there are very few developments just because of our servicing requirements being on private septic systems that typically don't fall into that category. So. I just wanted to just provide that additional information. Thank you, Director Prasad. Further comments? Good. Jamie, please continue. Certainly. Uh, so community benefits charges, I've alluded to that previously and provided a bit of a, an overview. That's items that are provided in the public interest, but doesn't apply to town of Tiny. So I, I don't think there's any more to say on that item. If there's any questions, I can... I don't believe so. No, I think we're good. So the next one's a bit of a big one. Uh, the next one relates to removal of upper tier approval powers. So basically the province here is stripping away some of the power of the county of Simcoe. In, in our instance, they've identified some regions and some counties where they would do that. It's not every county, but, uh, but Simcoe County is included within this. So what's being proposed is that approval authority for plans of subdivision at the county of Simcoe would be removed, official plans would be removed, official plan amendments would be removed. So effectively it would remove any land use planning function that the county of Simcoe currently has related to planning act applications and approved, including the approval of official plans. So currently the county is the approval authority for lower tier municipal official plans which Tiny has recently completed their official plan and, and the province and the county has reviewed and approved it. And then also approval authority for plans of subdivision applications currently. Uh, they hold that approval authority, not all for all municipalities in the, in the county, but for some right now. So basically uh, those approval authorities for OPs would get moved up to the province and the approval authority for plans of subdivision would likely get down to, to the lower tier municipalities. So Tiny would, would gain approval authority, which a number of your surrounding municipalities have already. So, and I think you're well positioned to deal with, quite frankly, you have a, plan, a good planning department. You've got planning consultants to rely on. So you're positioned to, to deal with those matters as well. Um, when will those changes take effect? We're not entirely sure. My understanding is, and this is kind of complicated, but you've likely been briefed that the, that the county is undertaking an MCR, which you'll see something on the next council agenda that's semi-related to that, that Sean and myself will be, be bringing to you. But the county is undertaking an MCR. Our understanding is that they're going to be allowed to finish that process, which will result in a county official plan update. So some changes to the county official plan. Then the township will have to update their official plan to conform. And once that conformity exercise is done, then it's my understanding that there, there will be no county official plan after that point. So that document won't, won't exist after that, which I think will take a few years to roll out and to 
to to be finalized. But at the end of the day, county planning functions will effectively be removed as it relates to to land use planning and, and planning applications. It's not to say they might lose their planning department entirely because there may be some planning needs at the county level, but most of their the work that they currently undertake, they they won't have responsibility for anymore. Thank you, Jamie. Comments? Councilor Walla, please. Thank you, Worship. Through you. Um, the second bullet point, just out of curiosity, are MZOs currently appealable? And is that uh, uh, what uh, ministers' decisions refers to, or, or do they have other powers as well? Uh, the second, um, the second bullet point relates to the minister just becoming the approval authority for OPs and official plan amendments. And as far as MZO is, is a different topic, but to specifically answer that question. No, MZOs aren't appealable. How a minute? What for those of you that may not be familiar, an MZO is a very powerful tool that's provided in the Planning Act that basically gives the minister the opportunity to write zoning that uh, that would override any zoning bylaw in the municipality, and um, usually that's tools used in very limited circumstances it's been used quite a bit more in the last two years but prior to that it was very um, i think i'd only seen one or two in my first 15 18 years of experience and we've seen 10 in the 20 in the last two years kind of thing but it's a pretty but those two those are not appealable and as far as when the county becomes approval authority on official plans um as the legislation is currently constructed, they're not their decisions aren't appealable on those items either. Thank you. Supplemental. Good. Any further discussions? I think we'll be talking about this when we finish the presentation. So um, please, Jamie, keep going. So the next item relates to third party appeals. So this is a bit of a big one too. Um, the province is through this legislation is not no longer permitting appeals for third party appeals to minor variance applications and consent applications. So what that means, third party appeals, what it means, someone submits an application for consent but to create a lot or minor variance for a, a setback relief or coverage relief, and the municipality approves it, there's no ability for neighbors to appeal that anymore. Um, so the municipality still has the ability wherever, or the applicant still has the ability to appeal. So if municipality denies a consent application or a minor variance, the, applicate, the applicant can appeal, but that neighbor or surrounding neighbors no longer have appeal abilities. And they've actually, that's already come into force and effect and the, and the Ontario Lands Tribunal has already sent out notices to anybody who had outstanding appeals. And, Sean, I'm not sure if there was any of those outstanding in tiny, but uh, yeah, Mayor Evans, there, that, that 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 doesn't apply uh, because there was no outstanding appeals, so there was no hearings that were cancelled. Um, we have updated our um, our notices for the committee of adjustment um, to to outline who can appeal, which is basically the neighbors are no longer permitted to appeal, and it's part of our education session with the committee of adjustment that we're going to be doing um later this month um because our anticipation is that as neighbors are not allowed to appeal um minor variance applications it could lengthen um committee of adjustment hearings because their only opportunity to be heard now is at the committee of adjustment table and it's important for the committee to understand that uh, all uh, comments made by neighbors are considered in the decision so that's going to be part of our training because this does have an impact. We don't get a lot of appeals. We may get a year on committee of adjustment files. So not a huge item for us, but just something for our committee to be trained on. Great. Thank you, Director Prasad. Any comments on that, Council? Early. Significant yeah. change. Okay, Jamie, yeah. please continue. Thank you, Your Worship. And it also, it just means it's that more important for neighbors to work together through the application process and to try to um, have their comments in as soon as possible and try to work constructively so that they're 
their issues can be heard and incorporated into whatever uh, approvals are are developed. So. Good, thank you. Um, so the next item relates to additional dwelling units. So the first bullet point. This is a question I get all the time from municipalities is does this or people I'm sure Sean's phone has been ringing off the hook since this came into effect with people saying, can I, I want a permit right now to construct a second dwelling unit as a result of this legislation. I'm sure he's got 50 of those calls already. Um, so what this legislation does is it does provide as of right zoning for as Sean mentioned previously up to three units, two in the main building, one in an accessory building but it only applies in fully serviced settlement areas. Tiny Township does not have any fully serviced settlement areas. So if you're in Midland or Penetang or, or City of Barrie, you could, you could seek, uh, seek approval to do these things, but not in Tiny Township. However, as Sean mentioned, through the official plan review and through the zoning bylaw update, the township has identified locations where additional dwelling units are permitted as of right, whether it's in the house or in the accessory building. So there have been steps undertaken within the zoning bylaw through the recent update to identify and to, even though it was done before this legislation change came into effect, the previous version of the planning act did uh, require municipalities to allow for additional dwelling units. Now it's basically making it as of right if you're in settlement. So that's the, the nuance or the change. So we have taken steps to undertake that. Okay. As Sean mentioned, any additional units would also be exempt from development charges. So if you want to put a basement apartment in, or if you want to put an apartment above your garage, there's no development charge associated with that. So that that's a, a an incentive, if you will, for to create that affordable housing alternative or option. Comments, Council? Councillor Bernal, please. Through you, Mary Evans. Um, uh, Jamie, uh, you just mentioned that there are some areas in a township of Tiny that will allow this uh, to happen. Uh, what areas, uh, well, I guess uh, probably a question to Sean, maybe. Um, what areas in Tiny, two questions, I guess. What 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 uh, areas in town, township of Tiny is, are allowed now? And what's the cri second question is what the criteria uh, that makes that area uh, uh, allowable to have this uh, uh, second and third dwellings. Yeah, Drew wants to speak to, sorry, Thanks please go ahead, Director Prasad. Thank you, Mayor Evans. Uh, through through you to uh, Councillor Bernal, great question. So through the official plan uh, process, uh, it was identified that the shoreline area was not an appropriate area for additional dwelling units. And, and the reason being is, um, well, a whole, whole bunch of reasons, but a lot of the comments that we heard from the community when we were developing the official plan um, was, was around um, environmental concerns, parking, um, density, beach density, um, ultimately the, with the potential of tripling the population on the shoreline uh, would potentially have significant impacts to the township. So that that was an area as well as um, seeing that area as highly um, seasonal um, versus the permanent population. Um, so basically everywhere else in the township other than the shoreline um, designation in the official plan and the shoreline residential zones and the zoning bylaw um, would be allowed to have additional dwelling units as of right in the zoning bylaw. Hopefully that answers that question, but happy to elaborate if needed. Councillor Bernal, is further? No, that's great. Thank you, Sean. Any other comments, questions? Your Worship, maybe if I could just add one point of clarity. And Please. From what Sean said, the official plan identifies from a planned function perspective, the way the official plan set up is that settlement areas are your focus of growth and development, limited development or growth and development is permitted in rural areas and shorelines are identified for recreational based development. So are there some permanent homes in the shoreline designation? Yes, there are. But the planned function of that area is for recreation or seasonal. 
So allowing for second dwelling units there doesn't achieve the growth management objectives of the official plan, which are to focus development to settling areas and then limited in rural areas. So that's that's one of the reasons as well why we went, we didn't permit additional units in shoreline areas, along with all the things Sean mentioned, a bit of intensity of use and everything else. Great. Thanks, Jamie. Any comments on that? Further comments, gentlemen? Um, maybe we'll touch it at the end, but I'll just, I'll just note it for later discussion. Obviously, uh, there's a lot of things being exempt from development charges. And uh, as our planning department has more needs and requirements put upon them, our, obviously our revenue streams are drying up um, and it'll have a, especially in the middle of budget season, um, implications for us moving forward in terms of how do we subsidize this? It's great to have control or, or additional control for development, but um, there's going to be obviously a cost in terms of uh, additional workload and cost associated with that. Further discussion, comments? I think we're okay, Jamie, please. So the next one, your worship and members of council relates to public meetings for subdivisions and plan, plans of condominium. So currently, if you are proposing a plan of subdivision or a plan of condominium and a so condominium is a form of subdivision. It's a it's a more of a shared format. But if you're proposing a plan of subdivision, which is the parcelization of a number of lots at one time, um, public meeting is no longer required. So historically, statutory public meeting under the Planning Act would be required. You give notice 20 days in advance, and you hear from the public. They've removed that requirement. However, what I'd like to just make very clear is that there's, I'm not, I don't know if I'm aware of there ever being a plan of subdivision that wasn't accompanied by a zoning bylaw amendment. And zoning bylaw amendments are still subject to a public meeting. So it's not like there isn't an opportunity for folks to comment. The, the opportunity is where the principle of use is established through the zoning bylaw amendment. Because Usually the amendment will speak to density and specific yard requirements and lot sizes and all those things that we see in a, in a subdivision agreement. So all is not lost with that item, but if you had a property that was pre-zoned for land and nothing happens for 20 years and someone wants to construct a subdivision that complied with all the zoning provisions, they could do it without having a public meeting. I think that's going to be very, very rare if ever. <clears throat> so that's a it's a change but it's a bit of a red herring almost there's not a whole lot that changes in the process okay <laughs> thank you jamie uh deputy mayor miskmans uh thanks uh through your worship thanks jamie for clarifying that was the one question i had on this because i thought wow that's uh uh, that's a that's a huge change, but it's good to hear that because of the zoning bylaws that uh, you know public consultation will still um, have an opportunity to happen um, through that uh, that provision. So that's uh, this, thanks for the clarity on that. And it's uh, and just, very helpful. Yeah, one other point of clarity to the deputy mayor your worship was that the the notification requirements are the same for what or were the same for plan subdivision and zoning. So there's no reduced notification requirements or anything. Any supplemental? Good. Thank you, Jamie. Please continue. So the next item relates to site plan control. Uh, so this is a pretty big change too, is that developments of up to 10 residential units will be exempted from site plan control. And that's in effect now. So what that means is if the municipality previously applied site plan control to shoreline residential properties, for example, and Sean, I'm not sure if you do, but that no longer applies. You don't currently? No. Okay. So that really doesn't have a lot of impact on, on you folks. And typic, so what site plan control is for the new members of council, if you're not aware, it's a tool that, the, that planners and municipalities have in the planning toolbox. And it's, a, it's usually used, it, do, it doesn't deal with use of lands, that's zoning, but what it does do is deal with the site design, for example. So if you have a commercial use or industrial use, you have to identify where your parking requirements, how, where, how parking's laid out, how entrances are laid out, how access to the building is, 
is gained, how accessibility to the building is provided, those sorts of things. And that all helps with the building department and the fire department as well evaluate the application for compliance with their metrics and different things. So if if you don't currently, and historically, most municipalities would only apply site plan control to, to multiple unit residential development. So uh, apartments and those sorts of things. So I guess that change really has limited applicability to you folks if you haven't been using it for residential historic. Is that fair to say, Sean? Yeah, that's correct, Jamie. Uh, most the the site plan that that we typically do in the township, uh, the council's um, information is uh, commercial, anything commercial, industrial. Those are automatic uh, site plan items that we have control over through site plan control. Um, the, the up to ten residential units doesn't really impact us. Um, the way that we've currently operated, it's more more of an urban. Um, impact. I know that um, some of the municipalities, like City of Barrie, City of Aurelia, they do a lot of site plan when it comes to um, residential units like that, smaller residential complexes up to 10 units, and it will impact those municipalities. Yeah. Yeah, just okay. one other thing on that. Even Which, if you were to have a townhouse development that has eight units, for example, or blocks of eight units where you couldn't apply site plan control anymore. You do through if the condominium is through the condominium agreement, or if it's a plan of subdivision through the plan of subdivision agreement, you have the ability to still capture the types of things you would normally capture historically captured through site plan control. So again, all is not lost. There's just another way to, to deal with it. Okay, good. Any questions? Please continue. So the final item relates, or sorry, the next item relates to the OLT or the Ontario Land Tribunal or the Local Planning Appeals Tribunal or the Ontario Municipal Board as everybody had historically referred to it as. Um, so this piece of legislation has gone through a number of name changes, but what they're also proposing to do now is to I don't know if the word is strengthen its powers a little bit, but try to get rid of frivolous appeals, for example. And what they're trying to do is give increased costs, like increased ability of the tribunal to award costs. So historically in courts, the loser pays, for example, that's never really been the case with the tribunal unless there's been something extremely, there's been very extenuating or untoward circumstances or very bad faith. Only in those circumstances would the tribunal award costs. So these changes potentially give the, the opportunity to the tribunal to award costs. It's really saying if you're going to play the game, if then you'd really need to, to step up and play the game kind of thing. So we don't know what that's going to look like, but that's what, or what those, what circumstances they may or may not award costs. That's yet to be seen, but that's just something that's that's come to light. And if someone is going to appeal something, they need to to take it seriously. Thank you. And then you they, they've also been given the ability to dismiss uh, appeals as well. So without even getting to a hearing, if someone's delaying for one reason or another. Or, they, they have the ability to dismiss. So, again, I think the thinking behind that is they don't want the tribunal holding up reasonable or appropriate development applications for unnecessary reasons. Great, thanks, Jamie. Any comments? We're good, keep going. This last item relates to conservation authorities. So this doesn't apply to you folks, uh, not under the jurisdiction of the conservation authority. Um, However, you do receive just in parallel, you do receive services from the uh, Seven Sound Environmental Association. If you are in another municipality in the county, um, I'm just kind of speaking towards the mayor and deputy mayor because they may hear about this at county council. But for other municipalities that are subject to conservation authorities, whether it's the Northern Saga Valley Conservation Authority or the Lake Simcoe Region Conservation Authority, their powers have been reduced in the recent years. Uh, those conservation authorities and their legislation originally was to focus on flooding and flood protection. And 
and those sorts of hazards in hazard lands. They've sort of morphed out and been more involved in environmental aspects as well, be it wetland review, natural heritage feature review, those sorts of things. And the province is basically saying you can't be involved in those natural heritage items anymore, that your focus is to be on hazard lands and hazard features. So in those other municipalities, the onus is going to fall on the municipalities to undertake peer reviews and those sorts of things within on natural heritage features. So currently they would ship their, a lot of municipalities ship their planning applications to the conservation authorities for review. Now they'll have to either hire staff or hire consultants to undertake that review for them. Great. So. Thanks, Jamie. Councillor Woma. Thank you, Worship, through you. So we still have the ability to consult on natural heritage features, uh, areas of sensitivity, et cetera, with SSCA if we have concerns over development in an area? Absolutely, yes. Thank you. Okay. Further comments, conservation authorities? Great, Jamie, please uh, just wrap it up. I think, that's, I think that's it from my perspective, but as um, as you can see from this, there's some loose ends and there's some things that need to be wrapped up through the, through regulations and everything coming into effect. So uh, they are substantial changes. I can tell you, I'd be a happy planner if things would stay the same for five years, even in this province from a planning perspective. It seems like the piece of legislation that gets updated the most in, in, uh, in the province in terms of things. So if you think it's challenging for you folks to keep up with things, I can all, like it's challenging for us, Sean and I as planners, to keep up with all the changes. So I can imagine with for counselors and and residents how how challenging it is. So as changes as it all evolves and new things come to light, we'll be sure to to bring you up to speed on on the changes. And I think Sean, there's some we wanted to just touch base on. Um, if I could just jump in, Jamie, just quickly, yeah. I just have a personal comment. Um, first of all, thank you very much for the presentation. I realize it's a moving target, um, but frankly, I couldn't think of a better person and the demeanor that you, you exhibit uh, dealing with all this. You make it uh, very understandable and uh, frankly, not that threatening at all. Um, I have a couple of concerns, a couple of things I just wanted to notice. I, I mentioned earlier about the our decreased ability to deal with, uh, with the costs associated with this moving forward, and I'm not putting on the spot to say how we're going to do that. That's up to us to figure out. Um, and I'm really concerned too about the, you know, the, the move away from an overall environmental protection, uh, and especially when you know, the effects of climate change are being felt throughout Ontario. And it's a, it's a big concern with a lot of our constituents and, uh, and, and certainly we're seeing it at the, we had a number of outages during Christmas, whether or not that's climate change related, but certainly the, <clears throat> the occurrence and of uh, uh, weather changes in our community is something that, um, uh, we're going to have to deal with, and uh, we want to make sure that any future development is uh, is, is uh, done properly, and to make sure that uh, it, it's taken into account. Um, just one other thing, I just mentioned, uh, I had read did a little bit of reading on it, and um, I believe there's a proposal to allow pits and quarries uh, to request official plan amendments within two years of a new official plan or a secondary plan coming into effect. Um, do you know anything about this? Is that something? Because obviously we have a we have a, a, a pit that we're uh, we're obviously very concerned about, and we monitor closely to make sure that there's no impacts from that. Um, is that something that's you, certainly? Do you have? I found it myself at the AMO site, but uh, anybody can go in there and have a look. Um, is there any more additional background, or that you can pass along on that? Certainly, your worship. So maybe dealing with that last question first, related to the the ability of aggregate operations to submit applications within two years. So um, historically, there was no limit. Anyone could submit a planning application at any point in time. That was kind of the way the planning act was constructed. A few years back with some changes to the legislation, there was a two-year moratorium put on planning applications when a new zoning bylaw was passed by a municipality so, or where an official plan was adopted. And the idea there was that we've got these new policies in place and we've got these new regulations in place. Let's work with them before people start trying to change them. That was sort of the thinking. That never really, 
And, and the thinking with that, I think, was in my view or my observation was that it was more to deal with urban areas where you have secondary plans that are comprehensively planned, for example. So in the south end of Barrie, they've got a, for example, they have a comprehensively planned two big secondary plans that have gone through detailed OP policies and detailed zoning to create a built form for that community. So the idea was that within two years of them adopting those items, people shouldn't be allowed to come in and change them. In a rural context, I've always advised my municipal clients that it didn't really serve a great purpose because a new OP or a new zoning bylaw wasn't establishing new zoning permissions or new official plan provisions necessarily or new land use provisions. It was really just providing an update to the documents and providing some, some parameters in which to work around, but not describing new land uses or not designating new areas for, for growth. So what this does is it basically says, if you're gonna have an aggregate, if you wanna propose a pit or a quarry, that two year moratorium doesn't apply. And even where the, when the historically, when the two year moratorium did apply, anyone could come to council and request the ability to make the application. So, so right now, if, if I'm, the township adopts a new official plan, I wanna make an official plan amendment, I can come before council and say, council, I'd like to make this application. Will you let me make this application within two years? And you can say yes, or you can say no. What that change does is it says that the aggregate industry doesn't have to come and ask permission to submit the application. They can just submit the application because the province knew that any aggregate operation coming to ask for permission is going to, the council is going to say, likely say, no, we're not even going to deal with this. And it would be kind of a never ending thing because it is a very, um, it's a land use that causes folks a lot of consternation and a lot of concern. So they were, they basically said this would basically, if this stayed, it would basically put a halt on any new pits and quarries throughout the entire province. And in, if we're going to build houses, we need aggregates. So we need to allow for, for these things, these applications in the process. That's kind of the, the reason. Okay. Thank so you. That was a bit of a long winded answer. No, oh, that's fine. No, uh, that's great. Good. Um, any other comments, questions on this? So, um, so I've got one more. I just wanted to just jump in before, I, before we move on. And uh, thank you, thank you again for your for your. Uh, I, I won't go into Bill Twenty Three, and and I realize there's lots of negatives, and it's and uh, as you mentioned, we we sit on Simcoe Council as well, and uh, we we're in a budget meeting yesterday and uh, heard from uh, the Simcoe people and. Um, same, same, uh, obviously the, the, the same uh, elements of the presentation, but uh, the, the the common theme is that um, still TBD uh, and, and in terms of upper level and lower level powers and tiers. Um, personally, I believe that, you know, we, regardless of the changes, um, we all live together, we all live in the same community and there's some functions still provided by the, or that are provided by the county that are integral to our, just as we are integral to them. So we, we're going to have to work together in the future even if we do have uh, added ability to uh, to control our own destiny from a planning perspective. But um, when I look at, uh, you know, there's things that we're going to have to, like it or not, we're going to have to deal with Bill 23. Um, I did a little bit of research and uh, and I know you've been working with with uh, Director Brassad in the past, with past council in, in terms of the uh, uh, strategic uh, land needs assessment with Simcoe. And, uh, and you mentioned the MCR earlier. Um, I have some serious concerns about uh, about that, and uh, and I know that it's in progress, and uh, it, I think I believe it, it's still to be TBD resolved. Uh, pertaining, frankly, to how this, the, I don't think it's a fair reflection of what this uh, township is, is is made up of, is composed of. Um, our population, uh, according to the uh, land needs assessment, is supposed to uh, top out at, uh, I believe the number here is in 2051 at 16,000, roughly 16,000 people. Um, uh, the last two years, three years, we're all uh, evidenced, uh, we've all been, we've all seen firsthand the number of people that have moved into the township um, on a full-time basis. Our, our permanent percentage of permanent population is north of 60% now. 
Um, you know, we're not a seasonal community anymore. We're a full-time community with a beautiful, the best recreational opportunities and, and frankly in the world that I believe in. Um, uh, the value of our house, our, our average house price now in Tiny is is uh, is actually higher than uh, the Metropolitan Toronto's average. Um, so a lot of people are being priced out of the uh, out of the market. So, uh, and I hear this a lot. Uh, I think this is the housing is a huge crisis in Tiny. Um, I heard it we, we, uh, before Christmas, there was an impromptu uh, fundraiser for people uh, for clothing uh, uh, organized by, uh, by Kate Thompson, a, a great constituent who pulled together to supply housing or clothing for people that are living in the tent city in Tiny. Um, you know, we've got, uh, we've got, We've got people that are, I was in the dog park last night and people that are, you know, working, that have jobs are having trouble to find rentals and rental accommodations. So, um, albeit there's a lot of new things we have to deal with, with, uh, with Bill 23, um, we as a council have to start putting some serious thought and looking at different options of how we can increase the, the housing supply in Tiny Township. Now, I know with land needs assessment, I know this is a work in progress. I, I, I haven't talked to Director Prasad about it, but I've seen his, his, uh, his work and we're, we're waiting uh, for you know, more feedback from the, from the, uh, the county. Um, but right now, for instance, we have no, uh, we have no uh, jobs and employment land. We are, we're not even designated to have any, any development and employment land in, in tiny. There's nothing there for the next Frankly, if, if you look at the, I don't, at the top of my head, there is 30 jobs scheduled or, or allocated in tiny for this year and 30 jobs in 2051. So this has a bearing, I'm, I'm not going to get into the numbers and what the actual numbers mean, but it does have bearing in terms of uh, what we can do moving forward to increase housing supply. I realize this, you know, we're part of a larger county um, and that development is going to be focused in the Bradford, West Gwillimbury area. And I get that. I understand that from a planning perspective, why that makes sense. Um, but we still have people living in tents in, uh, in the forest. And how do we provide opportunities, not just for people like that, but all levels. We have a lot of people that have, you know, as I mentioned, the house average house price is more than doubled. Um, so it's people that have grown up in this community uh, can no longer afford to live here and can no longer just, uh, uh, able to stay in their community so um i want to identify you know future developable lands in tiny i want to i know that uh, i we received a letter uh from the Dep uh, minister of housing uh, sorry ministry of municipal affairs and housing on december 12th 2022 that's uh, canvassing for our input uh in terms of uh, what we what we would like to do and what we would like to see uh so not that we uh, are are turning our back on county and going a different way but this frankly you know we mentioned this morning when we hit a wall uh, we don't stop we go around it we find a different way we'll try right we'll try left and we'll see what we can find so um again this is as a member of council i'm putting this forward not as a chair um we have an opportunity uh to uh, present our findings and what we'd like to uh present uh in terms of developing future developable lands in tiny um by February 3rd of 2023. So it would be my wish that we as council could agree that uh, to put together a motion that uh, we direct staff to uh, uh, address uh, and, and prepare a presentation um, that outlines our, our, our goals and our ideas and areas for future developable lands in the township uh, for review for the next uh, county uh, regular meeting is Madam Clerk, January, January 31st. The top of my head, I believe it's yes. Sorry, I can't hear you. Exactly. I'm sorry, Mary Evans. The next meeting of council is February first. February first. Yes, okay, so we're still. Uh, well, if we have the presentation ready, and I'm sure it'll be really good, we can just sign off on it. We can we can make the February third date. So uh, uh, I'll put it out to council. If if you see fit, uh, I'd be uh, be pleased if we could put together a motion and uh, and. A direction for staff to uh, prepare a response to the letter from the uh, deputy. Uh, uh, sorry, my, not the deputy, the minister of uh, municipal affairs and housing. Your worship, are you relinquishing the chair? I am relinquishing the chair in this position, as I mentioned, is uh, I relinquish the chair to uh, to uh, the council to uh, discuss the matter. 
So I guess this is over to me now. I guess uh, so. We'll open the floor for discussion on uh, Mayor Evans' uh, uh, motion for discussion. Over to you, uh, Councillor Walma. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you, uh, very supportive. Uh, anything we can do to increase uh, affordable, attainable housing in the community. I think we're. It's funny. I like how this has evolved. Uh, we got Jamie sitting here talking about Bill Twenty Three, which is a, a has a more full, more more homes. Uh, component to it. Um, just a quick update on things that have happened in the past, so everyone's aware. Uh, Council has looked at uh, our stock. Uh, we have uh, suggested a couple lands to the county uh, to develop as uh, affordable housing units. Unfortunately, uh, they, we've had issues with the criteria that's required. I don't know if that uh, has changed at all. Uh, that being that the lots have to be serviced both from a water uh, and wastewater perspective. Um, also had the opportunity to sit on the uh, affordable housing committee at the county. Um, there is $2 million uh, right now allocated annually uh, to rural affordable housing developments. Uh, so we, we may be able to access some of uh, that money. So I was just going to say that I'm 100% supportive of uh, asking staff uh, what uh, uh, developable lots we have uh, and look at that from a donation standpoint. Uh, we've also considered uh, uh, donations monetarily to, um, oh my, what's the building one? Habitat for Humanity. Yep. Thank yes. you. Yes. Um, so we, we've done that in the past. And then the uh, the final one was last year, 2021, uh, we donated uh, $100,000 uh, to the guest house shelter, understanding that that's an emergency shelter and not uh, necessarily uh, housing individuals, but it is uh, just something that I wanted to note that we have been involved with that. So if I could, on top of Mayor Evans' motion, which I would love to second, uh, could we also uh, add for a future discussion uh, the development of uh, an affordable housing advisory committee here in Tiny Township. Um, those are my thoughts for now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Walma. Uh, opening it up to uh, to others. No. All right. So we've got a motion uh, put forward. Do we have a mover and a seconder, please? I'll certainly move. All right, move move to, moved by uh, Mayor uh, Evans and seconded by Councillor Walma. Just waiting on the clerk, to, Madam Clerk, to uh, quickly type and print. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, um, Deputy Mayor Ms. Quinns, I believe uh, Sean Prasad uh, had his hand up. For a comment? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm still managing this. I haven't done chair yet. So uh, over to you, Director Prasad. My apologies. Deputy Mayor, uh, Ms. Cummins, thank you very much. Uh, maybe just a little bit of background on um, on that letter that came in. So um, just kind of tying it together. So they, so the, 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 we've been working with the, the County of Simcoe on their Municipal Comprehensive Review, their MCR, uh, which is which is a large growth management exercise that they're undertaking to determine where and and how many uh, how much development can go in the county across the board um we we provided comments to the county on their growth management numbers um last year they came back and said that's they're not, they're not supportive of that much they gave us something less uh which we accepted um so that's kind of, and and through that there was a county official plan amendment to adopt those uh, growth management numbers across the county What's happened since is the minister um, who's now reviewing the county official plan amendment has come back to all the mayors in the county and asked um, each municipality, um, are you happy with these numbers? What are you looking at? Uh, we, we did try to do some settlement area expansions um, through the township of tiny official plan. And we were told at the time by the county, no, you can't do that. You have to wait for this MCR process to happen first before you can expand any of your settlement areas. Um, so now we have an opportunity through this letter, uh, which uh, Jamie and I will be reporting back to Council on on February 1st at the council meeting, um, an opportunity to bring back some of those 
things that we originally proposed as far as settlement air expansions and the growth management numbers that we originally wanted. Um, so that's what we'll be comprehensively reporting back to council on February 1st. Thanks, Director Prasad. You're uh, you're obviously on it, so that's uh, that's great news to hear that you're uh, you're anticipating that. So we look forward to uh, to hearing uh, the report back on uh, at our next council meeting on February first. Thank you so much for that. Any further uh, discussion from the floor on this before we? Uh... Thank you, Madam Clerk. So we've got a uh, motion here moved by uh, Mayor Evans and seconded by Councillor Walma. Whereas council discussed available township lands for development purposes in relation to the affordable housing supply. Now, therefore, it is recommended that staff be directed to report back on development lands, developable lands in this regard for council's consideration and that future consideration be given to the possible development of an affordable housing committee. So as I mentioned, moved by Mayor Evans, seconded by Councillor Walma, all in favor? And that motion is carried. Thank you. I will uh, now relinquish the chair back to uh, to Mayor Evans. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Appreciate your support. Your Worship. Sorry, you. just uh, if I may jump in. ALM, please. Uh, so the motion that you pass is slightly different than what uh, um, Sean and Jamie are talking about. So with the motion you've passed, will set us forward on the pathway of looking at affordable housing, uh, potentially looking at establishing affordable housing committee and what that parameters would be, which is great. That gets that uh, up and running. Um, but uh, there will be a separate report that will come directly to the council meeting on uh, the first. So I wanted to make sure that that you, the motion that you just passed, that won't be coming directly to uh, to the meeting uh, in, a, in a week and a half time. That'll take a little bit more time to prepare, but uh, um, Sean and Jamie will be presenting a report directly to council on the first for their approval to submit to the province by the third deadline as it relates to potentially increasing our settlement boundaries, those type of items that we're looking for. So two issues on the table. I just wanted to make sure everybody was clear as to what issue was what. Thank you, CIO Lamb. Yeah, I, I had, uh, I, I understand the differentiation that's between the two. I believe we do. Um, the affordable housing one was, frankly, Councillor Walma, that was a good catch. I was more about land, developable land, but uh, bringing up the committee, I think it's a great idea. So, yeah, well, but obviously we're very excited and look forward to the report moving forward. Uh, Anybody, Jamie, is there anything else you want to add, uh, Sean, anything to this? And then we'll let uh, let Jamie get back to work. <laughs> Mayor Evans, maybe just to follow up um, to some of these items. So uh, as Jamie kind of noted already, but as, as, as further regulations come out and further impacts are known, um, you know, when I look at uh, the parkland, the, the parkland um, item, one of the things that some of the planning directors across the county, we, we, have, a, we have formed a group to look at it, potentially developing a parkland uh, bylaws so that might be something that, that comes back in front of council, as well as once we have regulations on uh, the removal of the upper approval powers. That's obviously a significant item for us, as we do rely on the county of Simcoe uh, planning staff for for a lot of our policy review when it comes to their official plan as well as provincial policy, and we work quite integrated with them with all development applications. So losing uh, that amount of staff and support for us will have an impact on our operations. Um, so we will be reporting back to you on that once we know more and, and how that all flushes out. Um, the other thing that we that I want to note is uh, there's also changes to the Ontario Heritage Act. Um, and that is an item that's included in the 2023 budget for the Heritage Committee to work on a project to look at the Municipal Heritage Register and integrate Bill 23 into the way that we do things as far as listing and designating properties in the township. Um, that, that is an item that we, we are already dealing with. Uh, but just want to assure council that as, as we know more, we will be reporting back. Thank you, Director Prasad. Jamie, is there anything you want to add as a wrap up? Uh, no, Your Worship. Just thank you 
to everyone for the opportunity and look forward to uh, to seeing you throughout your term. And thank you. Thanks again. And have a great day with the rest of your yeah. On behalf of council and, and Tiny, certainly like to thank you for your efforts and, and uh, sounds like we'll be seeing more, not less of you in the future. And I look forward to that. Thank you. Have a great day. All right. Bye for now. Bye. Madam Clerk, we're 20 to 11. We left off at, I believe we completed item F1.3. Um, do we want to take a 10 minute bio break? Uh, and we'll come back at uh, 10.50 a.m. All those, in, uh, can I have a motion for that, please? Deputy Mayor Miskimans, Councillor Holoka, adjourns at 10.40. And we should, as I said, be back in 10 minutes at 10.50 a.m. Thank you.
sitting in the blue chair. Honestly, I'll sit down there. Like, <laughs> it's so you find it. Yeah, yeah. It's nice shot. I think we're ready when ready. We are now back. Thank you. Aaron. Okay. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, we are back. It is, a, sorry, it is 10.55. Moved by Deputy Mayor Miskimans. Seconded by Councillor Walma. All those in favor? The matter is carried. Back in session. Thank you. Uh, the first item, uh, a little remiss. Uh, we, we had just, hope you were present for our per uh, presentation from uh, Jamie Robinson of MHPC on uh, Bill 23. Uh, I'd like to have a mover and a seconder, please, at the presentation from Jamie Robinson, MHPC Planning. Regarding an overview of the More Homes Built Faster Act, Bill 23, be received as information. Councillor Bernal. Seconded by Councillor Holoka. Those in favor? We're all for that. It's carried. Thank you. Uh, now, if you refer to the agenda, um, we left off at item F1.3, um, F1.4, 1.5, F1.6, and F1.7. Uh, these are for informational. Does anybody have any comments or would like to pull an item for further discussion? Councillor Bernal, please. Yes, uh, I want to pull uh, F1. F.1.4 for the elections accessibility report. Um, I think it's great to see uh, the, the feedback form. It was uh, excellent. Uh, um, obviously, we want uh, the election to be as accessible as possible. Can Is it possible to have uh, uh, a feedback from the general population, uh, from the, uh, our constituents about the what what transpired over the uh, during the elections? Uh, is that possible? Thank you, Councillor Brunel. Just to clarify, you're looking for feedback on uh, election accessibility report, uh, or you, you mentioned about elections overall. Elections overall. Um, uh, I think a lot of people were a uh, little, uh, uh, I guess, unclear uh, about the mail-in ballot situation, vote by mail. Um, because it, Was there an opportunity for people to come in in person with their mail-in ballots to fill it out? I think it was, but again, it, it, there was just a, a few things that I think we need to hear from our constituents about the way the elections were were, uh, were held. I know in Pantang, they, they had electronic uh, uh, in Midland. So it was just, uh, it, it just seemed a little uh, out of sorts for some people. I know some people actually went to a polling station uh, uh, <laughs> when there wasn't a polling station. So uh, it, it, I think we just need to, uh, and again, if we're gonna focus on accessibility, uh, make it very clear, uh, I believe clear next time of what uh, people can do, but can't do um, and encourage uh, uh, um, all, all always uh, all methods of voting uh, if possible for next time. So I think we I'd just like to see some feedback from the from uh, the residents about that. Okay, council uh, for discussion. Would you like to weigh in on this? My bad. Sorry, Councillor Wama. Uh, thank you, Worship. Through you. 
I uh, just wanted to, uh, I guess, say that uh, I agree that uh, the more feedback we can get, the better. So thank you for that, uh, Councillor Brunel. Maybe a suggestion is as easy as including uh, when we send this out uh, in the future, uh, To uh, we use our uh, Tiny Connect, and it could be as simple as adding a, uh, a comment page, being like maybe even a separate email. Uh, we'd like to hear from you, uh, your comments on uh, the ease of the uh, election, uh, what uh, methods you would prefer, that kind of stuff, and literally just have it as an email response back and, and see what kind of uh, information we can collect in that regard. Councilor Brunel, how your thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, actually, uh, I guess as coming up, we are, we are going to be talking about town hall meetings, so uh, maybe that could be an item at the town hall meeting too that we can uh, discuss uh, also. Okay. I just want to sort of clarify here, though, that um, you know, is this something we want to give staff direction on in terms of uh, trying to just narrow narrow the requirement down, narrow the ask down in terms of do we want to do you want to propose a motion say that uh, give staff direction to find avenues for feedback or or there's a specific type of feedback you're looking for through you, Mr. Chair, if I may. CAOLM, please. Yeah, sorry. So the report you have in front of you is part of the uh, legislative requirement from the Accessibility Act. It actually is not anything to do with the upcoming future elections. So I, I want to make sure that we don't lose fact that this is simply a report that re meets that legislative requirement. Uh, your clerk's office will be coming forward to you at a future council meeting with a report that asks council to give direction as to what style of elections that uh, you would have wished to have for the next election. Council makes that decision, not staff. Uh, and so at that point in time, I would, I, I'm would i simply suggesting you may want to defer the discussions that you're having now to when we have that report coming forward uh, so that then the clerk uh, can take that direction once that report comes through, gather the type of information council is looking forward, and then they will be able to make their decision when we get closer to the, uh, the 20, 26 election date uh, versus the simple legislative requirement of this this election itself. Councillor Brunel, is that amenable? Yes, um, I just, um, uh, I the point I was bringing up is that, okay, you know, we have an accessibility elections feedback, which it sounds like it, we have to do. Um, it, uh, I'd be in favor of having a second uh, feedback form, whatever way, Tiny Connect, whatever way we make it look like, but I guess it sounds like it's a council decision or mm -hmm. um, initiative. Um, I just wanted to bring it up so no further discussion is necessary at this time. Okay. In my okay, thank you. Deputy Mayor Miskmans, I saw your hand was up. Any comments? Uh, yeah, I, uh, CAO Lamb beat me to the punch on that. I just wanted to bring okay. focus back to what the purpose of that report was and that this um, election feedback from the constituents is very important, but it is a separate subject line from this. So thank you, CAO Lamb, for jumping in there before I could. Okay, good. So I will take the liberty then of saying the uh, item F1.4, we can leave that for today and have a discussion, a future discussion uh, with regards to... Uh, election feedback uh, in the future. Um, just to follow up again, if 1.4, 1.5, 1.6, or 1.7, any further comments? If not, I'd like a mover and a seconder, please, that the following consent item under section F staff reports be received as information with the exception of item F 1.3. Uh, that we already did, verbal update for the hybrid council meetings. This includes Wybridge County Canada Post location update, outdoor ice rink update, the clerk's report, CR 004-23, which is the election accessibility report, and uh, the assignment sheet of 12-14-2022. The mover, Councillor Brunel, thank you. Seconded by Deputy Mayor Miskimans. Those in favor? Motion is carried, thank you. Move on to matters for consideration. The first one being a bylaw to authorize a levy of taxes before the estimates are adopted for the year 2023. Director LeBlanc, would you like the opportunity to speak to this item? Sure, um, thank you, Mayor Evans. Uh, 
for you uh, to counsel. Uh, the two bylaws, actually, I'll speak to both of them, uh, if that's all right. Um, before you are just uh, housekeeping bylaws, they're annual bylaws that we have to issue at the beginning of the year. Um, the first one allows us to um, issue interim taxes, uh, which go out in February with a due date of March 31st this year. Um, and typically, uh, we're allowed to uh, invoice up to 50% of last year's levy. Um, so we will be issuing a 50% bill for last year's levy. Um, so that's the first bylaw. The second one, uh, we do have a line of credit with uh, TD Bank uh, of $1.5 million. Um, this line of credit is so uh, is, is there for us to use if we require it uh, before we actually collect the, um, the interim tax amount, because we do have expenses that we are incurring uh, as a municipality uh, for the beginning of the year. Um, so typically we don't access that line of credit, um, but it is there for that purpose. So those two bylaws um, are just housekeeping. They'll, you'll see them every year come forward at the beginning of the year. Thank you, Director LeBlond. Discussion council on either of the items? Okay, can I have a motion and a seconder to uh, authorize a levy of taxes before the estimates are adopted for the year 2023 be presented? for formal approval at the February 1st, 2023 regular meeting of council. Moved by Councillor Holoka, seconded by Deputy Mayor Miskimans. All those in favor? Those opposed? The motion is carried. Secondly, a proposed bylaw 20, 23-002 is a bylaw to authorize the aggregate borrowing of $1.5 million for the year 2023 be presented for formal approval at the February 1st, 2023 regular meeting of council. Moved by Councillor Walma. Seconded by Councillor Burnell. Those in favor? The motion is carried. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is uh, the appointment of an alternate member of the upper tier council. Um, council, do I, have a, do I have a candidate for uh, for alternate member? Anybody like to step up? Councilor Wama? Thank you, Thank Your you. Worship. With, uh, yes. as I was gonna say, with uh, council's blessing, I would uh, love the opportunity to uh, fill in. Uh, I enjoyed uh, uh, serving at uh, County Council the last go around. It was uh, a time constraint, and uh, I think that uh, I have uh, uh, I have the time in my schedule to do uh, the fill in component, and uh, potentially uh, if uh, uh, the mayor or deputy mayor are unable to go, both of them have my contact number, and uh, we can we can work it out. But uh, uh, I would uh, appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wong. Appreciate it. Any discussion? Those in favor? Sorry, and motion is carried. Moved by Councillor Walma. Seconded by Deputy Mayor Miskimmons. Your Worship, I'd prefer not to move that motion. <laughs> Fair enough. Councillor Brunel. Deputy Mayor Miskimmons. Sorry, Mayor Evans. Um, so, so that was moved by Councillor Brunel and seconded by Deputy, Deputy Mayor, Mayor okay. Miskimmons. Thank you. Yes. Sorry. Um, again, we're jumping over uh, to item F 2.6. Um, Chief Llewelling, I wonder if you're uh, available just to give us a little bit of background on this. I think it's pretty self explanatory. Please go ahead. Good morning, Council. Uh, to the Chair, to the rest of the Council. I believe the report is uh, fairly uh, straightforward, uh, but if there are specific questions, I, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, back in November, we did uh, come before Council and uh, Council directed us to purchase a hybrid vehicle, which extended our uh, lead time on it till sometime in 2024. And with them in the report, I've identified the uh, alternate solutions that we're going to use until the delivery of the vehicle is uh, till we receive it. Thanks, Chief. Comments, questions, Council? 
Councilor Walmart, please. Uh, thank you, Worship Through You. This is uh, just for information towards another one. When we purchase a vehicle that far in advance, does the municipality uh, have to put a deposit down? Is it paid in full? How does uh, how does that particular component work? No, there's no no deposit required. Just in this case, as I noted in the original report in uh, November, uh, because we're because of the timelines, we're almost two years two years out, or originally had the time to report a year and a half. Uh, the only thing the dealership has put in because they can't, they don't know what the price is going to be from a year and a half from now. They've only asked that uh, for each for each uh, model year that we uh, that we surpass and not have delivery, that there's an option for a two thousand dollar maximum increase, and it may not be that. And we have the option to get out at that point if we no longer want to. Uh, thank you, Chief. Supplemental, please. So uh, I guess my this is an example of why. Uh, and I know we've uh, uh, glanced over it at uh, budget, but uh, multi-year budgets, uh, especially from a capital perspective, are uh, worthwhile investigating because if we're looking at a two-year lead time in purchasing hybrid or electric vehicles, and that's something that we want to pursue, mm -hmm. uh, I know that we'll have other vehicles uh, coming up for 2024, 2025, and maybe we need to be start considering those acquisitions now. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Councillor uh, Walmer. Um, if I can follow up to that again, Mayor Evans. Sure, Chief, mind. please. Yep. Sorry, yeah, yeah, that's a great point uh, Councillor Walmer has brought, brought forward. And if uh, for this council's information as well, uh, last year we uh, entered into an agreement for a tanker that we will not take delivery for until 2025. So uh, that's how far out we are on fire apparatus now. So uh, we're, we're looking at our replacement schedules and we'll be coming before council well in advance to uh, to ensure we get our replacement uh, well before our 20 year expiry of our apparatus. Okay. Thank you, Chief. Further? Um, personal comment, um, perhaps to Director LeBlanc. Uh, vehicles are obviously part of our, our, I assume, are part of our asset management plan and program. Uh, you know, is something that to uh, Councillor Walma's uh, point about uh, if multi-year budgets, if they're already in the asset management plan, it shouldn't, I would think, be that difficult to start planning for those on a, on a roughly, a, is it a 10-year scale we're using for, for vehicles, 10 or 15 moving forward? I'm just curious uh, if, if this is something that we could uh, we could look at for, for next year. Thank you, uh, through you, Mayor Evans, to Council and the public. Yeah, so the asset management plan, that is the whole purpose of it, is to, to plan out uh, what expenditures we're going to require in any given year. Uh, mm -hmm. Vehicles are definitely included in that. Um, it isn't a core asset at this point in time. We are focusing on core. Um, so uh, we do plan, though, staff do recognize the needs they're going to have, especially if, uh, if some of our fleet are aging. So, for example, Public Works does often put away uh, for future um, needs. Uh, you know, for example, you'll see in this capital budget, um, when we're talking about it, they have put away for, for future expenses. So essentially, it is almost like multi-year budgeting. We're just not presenting mm -hmm. it as a multi-year. Uh, so I hope that answers your question. By all means, yes, it did. Thank you. Further discussion? Okay, I have a motion. There, emergency Service Report ESR-001-23 regarding the Fire Inspector Vehicle Interim Solution be received and that Council approve option one of the report with staff to utilize the Fire de Department fleet as an interim solution until such time as the hybrid vehicle is purchased. And further, that any associated costs be taken from the revenues of the short-term rental licensing bylaw. Can I have a mover, please? Councillor Holoka, thank you. Seconder, Deputy Mayor Miskimans. Those in favor? Sorry, if I may. Uh, Please, sorry, Director I don't, LeBlanc. I don't mean to interrupt, but uh, just the last wording in that, um, in that recommendation it shouldn't say bylaw, it should say reserve. I just wanted to clarify that. Great. Thank you, Director LeBlanc. I'll, I'll make note of that on here. Thank you. Figure that's what it was. Okay. Thanks, Chief. Appreciate you coming in. Thank you. Uh, the next item is a, a planning and development report. We discussed this uh, a little while ago regarding a zoning bylaw amendment application as it relates to 37 concession 13 West be received. 
and that bylaw 23-003 being a bylaw to amend zoning bylaws 06-001 and 22-075 as amended be formally approved at the February 1, 2023 regular meeting of council. Can I have a forward please? Deputy Mayor Miskimmons. Seconded by Councillor Brunel. All those in favor? Motion is carried. Thank you. The next item, uh, Planning develop, Development Report PD-002-23 is an appointment of a building official. Um, uh, perhaps we need a little bit of background on this. Uh, Director Prasad, is this something that you can speak to? It is Mayor Evans. I'm happy to speak to this one. Thank you. So this is um, this, this appointment as a result of the uh, short-term rental program. Uh, one of the uh, positions as part of that pro the rollout of that program is a two-year contract for a building official. So we've gone through the recruitment process um, and have recruited um, um, Jonathan uh, Felice to the uh, position. And uh, one of the requirements is the approval of this bylaw. And uh, I'm happy to answer any questions if council has any. Thank you, Sean. Uh, any questions, council? Councillor Holoka, please. Yes, uh, through you, your worship. Uh, Director Prasad, what exactly is uh, Mr. Felice's uh, duties? What have you got them lined up uh, to do? Yeah, great question, Councillor Holoka. So the duties that he'll be reviewing as part of the STR bylaw will be, um, he'll be looking at all the building related components with, when a, when a short-term rental license application comes in. So looking at the floor plans of the, of the uh, building to make sure they match up with our records, making sure that the number of bedrooms um, associated with that uh, building matches our sewage system records, ensuring that there's no building code violations or orders on the property, uh, making sure uh, the building is uh, in safe condition, ultimately for, uh, for building uh, sign-off. They are also going to be looking at um, just double-checking the zoning of the property to make sure it's in compliance with our zoning bylaw, number of parking spaces, both be looking after everything related to uh, uh, my department, uh, relative to the, the STR bylaw. Yes, and uh, just a please go on. supplemental of that. Will there be any coordination with the fire department as far as CO2 and fire alarm inspections? Uh, through you, Mayor Evans, absolutely, yes. So the, the fire department is also, um, their their new uh, hire will also will be looking at th those requirements in conjunction with the building department to make sure all the our, all of our records match up. Um, so there will be coordination between the two departments as well as the short-term rental licensing officer <laughs> for issuing that permit. This position will also be looking at if there are outstanding items uh, relative to any building permit inspections or any follow-up, they will be uh, coordinating that to making sure that we get permits closed off before we issue or any life safety issues are dealt with. Um, it is a junior position. Um, so there may be a, additional support from uh, our, our senior inspectors, uh, but that, that this will be their primary role for the two-year contract. Thank you, Director Prasad. Anything further, Councilor Holoka? No, thank you very much, Director Prasad. Council? Director Prasad, personal question. Um, this the, the data that's accumulated by, by this person, how, how is it accessible to staff? Is it, it's, uh, I'm sure, is it easily accessible? I'm just thinking that as, as we go through this and we start cataloging all the, the short-term mental accommodation facilities in the township, um, you know, accessing this data in, in a real time uh, might be a little difficult if it's uh, if it's in, on paper or in filing. Um, how are we cataloging and, and uh, making this data accessible to bylaw department to be able to act quickly on the on the any complaints or concerns moving forward? 
Yeah, great question, Mayor Evans. So, so the the infra, like all the building permit records that we have, most of those are digital now. So th this individual will be, be able to review those files digitally. Most of our sewage records are digital as well. Um, so they'll be able to access those. Um, we're gonna we we're utilizing the uh, Granicus host compliance software for the building in the intake of the licensing applications. Um, so all staff um, from uh, building, fire, uh, and bylaw all have access to the Granicus software to review all the all the material that's submitted with an application. So that's how all the information is going to be coordinated. Uh, when complaints come in, the licensing officer. Um, can do an easy check to see if, uh, if a license has been uh, applied for or issued to determine if there's non-compliance with the, uh, the STR uh, bylaw. Um, but I won't get into any details with regards to the kind of the enforcement side. That's not my specific area. But generally speaking, that's how it would, it would, it would operate. Perfect. That's what I want to know. Thank you, Director Prasad. Councillor Holka? Yeah, just one final question through you, Your Worship. Uh, Director Prasad, when does Mr. Felice start um, his starting date? Um, through you, through you, Mayor Evans, uh, his start date was actually Monday. Um, right now, he's just training. Uh, once this bylaw is approved, then he'll have the uh, formal ability to go and start uh, start working under the Ontario Building Code as an officer for the municipality. Um, so right now he's just in training, and uh, actually we will be uh, we will we will uh, introduce him to council at the next meeting. Okay, great. Thank you. Anything further, Councillor Holka? Great. Look forward to it. Okay. Um, any further questions, discussions? We're good to go. Okay. The, uh, so the, the recommendation that we're approving right now is that Planning and Development Report PD002-23 regarding the appointment of a building official be received and that proposed bylaw 23-005 to appoint Mr. Jonathan Felice as building official for the Township of Tiny for the purposes of short-term rental licensing and enforcement of the Ontario Building Code be presented for formal approval at the February 1st, 2023 regular meeting of council. Can I have a mover, please? Councillor Holoka. Thank you. Councillor Burnell. All those in favor? The motion's carried. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Director. Sir. Yeah, before we leave that, just a, land, please. Just a uh, uh, kind of a learning motion moment for all of the new council, because we have so many new uh, uh, members of council. Uh, your bylaw officers, your uh, building inspectors are all what they call officers of the corporation. So they only legally can do their job once an authorization bylaw has been passed. So that's why you're going to see every time if there's been a change in a, a building inspector, they actually can't go out and do the job until a bylaw is passed. So this is the type of a report you will see quite often because without that authority of the bylaw, they don't have the ability to actually do their job uh, under the acts. So. Okay. Thank you, CAOL. Appreciate the background. Good. All right. The uh, next item, uh, item F2.9, is uh, Copeland Creek South final acceptance and release of securities. Any comments or discussions, Council? I think we're good. Okay. Uh, so the the public uh, the recommendation is the Public Works Report PWR 001-23 regarding the Copeland Creek South subdivision final acceptance and release of securities be received, and that the works included in the Copeland Creek South subdivision 51M-1136 be accepted for use and operation by the township and that council directs staff to bring forward a bylaw to assume Glen Howard Court as a public highway and that council authorizes the release of all remaining securities to the developer as outlined in the subdivision agreement. So I have a forwarder please. Councillor Walma, seconded by Deputy Mayor Miskimans. All those in favor? And the motion is carried. Thank you. We'll now jump back to item F2.4, which is the clerk's report regarding 2023 council and committee meeting schedule and format. Uh, Madam Clerk, I'll uh, pass it back to you. Uh, thank you, Mayor Evans. 
so before council is a report with regards to the 2023 council and committee meeting schedule um, as directed by council at the November 30th meeting, uh, staff was asked to review an amended schedule to take into consideration evening meetings. Uh, as part of the report, uh, we've pro provided uh, background information. And um, just a, a note that the procedure bylaw is reviewed periodically to consider any legislative changes that uh, may impact it, and also for the purposes of creating efficiencies on how the meetings are governed and scheduled. So traditionally, um, to me, the whole meetings have been held during the day, and the consolidated meetings were implemented to realize efficiencies, noting minimal in-person attendance by the public in the evening, and that the council meetings uh, generally are adjourned uh, fairly quickly. Um, we can do a council meeting being adjourned within 15 minutes of uh, calling the meeting to order or, you know, uh, 30 minutes, depending what's on the agenda. In order to make the changes to the current meeting schedule, um, it was noted previously that the procedure bylaw uh, would require amendment and that uh, this requires a public notice. So within the report, we just speak to the timelines of what this means uh, with this process in the event that uh, council does deem it necessary to move to a different schedule. So basically, council is reviewing the report today and they'll provide any direction. Um, that recommended direction would be approved at the February 1st um, council meeting. And then if changes are proposed to the meeting schedule, then um, the clerk's department would issue a public notice uh, and the proposed procedure bylaw amendment to enact the changes would be uh, presented at the February 22nd uh, regular meeting of council. Uh, once the procedural bylaw amendment is ratified, uh, the new schedule would be implemented if that's the decision of council. And then we obviously have an internal external communication campaign to uh, make sure that the public's aware of any changes that may impact uh, their attendance. Um, within the report, um, we have provided four options for council to consider. Um, the first option uh, being status quo, that everything remains the same. Uh, the format continues on as it is now with the meeting starting at 9 a.m. Uh, and uh, every third Wednesday uh, with the committee of the whole to immediately follow after the council meeting at 9 a.m. And then uh, the planning public meetings would be scheduled at 6 p.m. on those evenings as required. Uh, considerations for this option would be uh, everything status quo, so there's no requirement to amend the procedure bylaw or issue a public notice. Uh, no need for the planning meetings to be rescheduled on a separate date. Uh, it does not accommodate public who work during the day and wish to attend in person, but we do have the abilities uh, for the public to um, either watch the meeting while it's being live streamed or watch it afterwards as they're archived to our YouTube channel for a year. And there's no need for a summer recess with this option. Um, option two would be basically uh, everything would be status quo. However, the council meeting would start at 6 p.m. with a committee of the whole meeting to follow after that. Um, the la latest hour for adjournment in this case would be 11 p.m. unless it's extended by resolution of council as supported by all members. And in this scenario, the public meetings would have to be scheduled on a separate date uh, just to create efficiencies there. Uh, with this option, there is a requirement of the public notice uh, and procedure bylaw amendment. Uh, the meetings are li likely to run late into the evening and um, concern that sound decision making may be impeded as the evening progresses and council and staff become fatigued. Uh, there would be financial implications due to staff overtime. And as noted, the public planning meetings would have to be scheduled on a separate date. It does accommodate residents who may wish to attend in person. And just to note that again, if they're not able to, we do have uh, everything's archived to our YouTube channel. The third option is um, that they're held every third, every third Wednesday with the committee the whole. I'll, I'll give this month as an example for this uh, for this option. So in this example, uh, the committee of the whole would be held on January 11th at 6 p.m. with the council meeting being held uh, um, three weeks later on February 1st. Uh, so the latest hour for adjournment for these meetings, again, would be 11 p.m. unless extended by resolution. And the planning public meetings could be accommodated at 6 p.m. Uh, on the, uh, the day of the council meeting. Um, considerations in this um, with this option is that we do require the amendment to the procedure bill and public notice. Only one opportunity for staff to present time sensitive matters for consideration outside of a special meeting may impede efficiencies by delaying approvals to carry out business, uh, financial impact due to staff overtime. It does accommodate residents who wish to attend 
uh, in the evening in person, um, and no summer recess would be required in this instance. Option four would be uh, the second last Wednesday of the month. So Committee of the Whole would be held, um, for instance, would be held on January the 11th, if we use this month as an example. And then um, the regular meeting of council would be held two, week, two weeks later. Uh, so that eliminates um, too much of a time period in between the Committee of the Whole and the regular meeting of council. Um, and again, the latest hour adjournment for these meetings would be 11 p.m. unless extended by resolution. Um, it lessens the time between the committee, the whole, and council meetings to assist with expedient review of time-sensitive matters. Uh, there's no need for a separate planning public meeting with this consideration and um, decreases the potential for meetings running late into the evening. Uh, again, there would be the financial impact due to staff overtime, and it would accommodate residents who wish to attend in person that can't do so during the day. Um, so those are the options that staff have uh, provided to council uh, for consideration and discussion, and uh, obviously open to any other suggestions that council may have to, uh, if they wish to accommodate in the meeting. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Okay, council, who'd like to start? Deputy Mayor Miskimans, please. Thank you, through you, Your Worship. So uh, thanks, staff, uh, for uh, putting all these options together. There's lots to consider here. Um, and it's uh, an interesting uh, one where I think we will probably have a little bit of conversation here um, because there's much to consider while balancing the need to move business forward while at the same time trying to uh, manage public um, and their opportunity to attend. It's nice having that update about the hybrid meeting format that we've uh, that we've discussed already this morning. Uh, Myself, I like expediency, so I'm, uh, you know, I'm really considering option four as uh, as my personal preference here. It uh, allows us to have a discussion and then move things forward two weeks later, and also gives staff adequate time to provide any documentation, staff reports, and uh, again con continue to move the business of the municipality uh, forward. So those are my thoughts, initial thoughts, anyways. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Appreciate that, Councillor Woma. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. Uh, with respect, I uh, am more of a uh, status quo for this one, option one. Uh, when I think about the <clears throat> expediency component, while I do agree if uh, you're bringing something forward at a committee of the whole meeting, it does appear that you're able to deal with it uh, in two weeks' time. There is technically a four-week delay before anything happens. So if uh, something arose uh, the following day from that council meeting, there isn't another council meeting for an entire month. So, and that could be up to five weeks. So there is, we're going from the ability to ratify a motion every three weeks to ratifying a motion every five weeks. Um, that being said, if uh, you can always have emergency meetings, uh, but I would say that those uh, those shouldn't happen uh, frequently. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna talk about this uh, in two components. From uh, a personal perspective, um, evenings for me are family time. That's when the kids aren't in school. That's when my wife's not working. And uh, I would personally prefer to be at home. Uh, I've also, the I've, uh, ex I've been very uh, upfront about my work commitments. And uh, regardless of the uh, timing, I have days where I miss. Uh, so more frequent meetings means for me that I will potentially miss more and my vacation picks are annually. So I've already attempted to accommodate some of our existing meetings through vacation picks. Take the personal portion out now. I'll talk about it from a corporate perspective. Overtime costs, uh, potentially more council costs. If we're moving more of these meetings, our planning meetings will then be outside of those council days. Uh, so planning meetings fall within uh, our expense policies. So that would be another $60 for every meeting. Uh, so again, not supportive of that. Uh, committees uh, are run by the same staff. So we haven't even started into our committee components and we're asking our directors. So I know that uh, uh, Director Walton was our accessibility rep. We have Robert that uh, ran our STR task force. Uh, Director Leach is on Parks and Recreation. He's on the advisory committee. He's on basically just name the committee and he's on it. I think it uh, from a work-life balance, I, I, dis, I dislike the effect that uh, moving our meetings completely to evenings has. Uh, if it's about accommodating work, 
uh, from a personal perspective, like, and I'm talking about Calc's perspective, because this is, this is really about us. Uh, I think there's other ways that we can come up with uh, solutions uh, to do this. And one of them potentially uh, from a legisl- re- legislative perspective, uh, we the council, this is not what you want to do. I'm just talking about the legislative component. You have to make one meeting in every three months. So that being the absolute low bar component, um, I'm suggesting that uh, maybe we could look at having our council meetings in an evening uh, session. That means that that same individual, if they have to miss the work, uh, miss a committee of the whole for a work day, can do the council portion. If they miss something super serious to them, they can bring it up for discussion under new business. uh, And they're still meeting their legislative requirements for being here. It could also be in the morning prior to the workday. I'm fine with coming in at 7 a.m. to do a 30-minute council meeting. Council meetings generally are shorter uh, shorter meeting time frames. Uh, what else do I have written down here? Um, I have other components uh, that I'd like to talk about for the, the year-long meeting schedule, but I think that uh, for, uh, I'll leave it at that for now, Your Worship. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wama. Further discussion? Councillor Bernal, please. Yes, uh, there's been some great points so far. Um, so I've got a few things. I just want to get clarification um, through you, Mayor, uh, with uh, uh, Councillor Wama. You mentioned something about the planning public meetings uh, having to be separate. I, I just want to get clarification uh, because it says on option number four that the planning public meetings as required to commence prior to the council meeting. So. I think you mentioned that it would be separate uh, at separate times, so an additional time. Uh, can you clarify that for me, please? Councillor Waller? Uh, sorry, Councillor Brunel. Uh, misspoke based on option four. One of the options had planning meetings on separate days. Okay. My apologies. Okay, okay. no problem. Okay. Um, now, uh, uh, Councillor Wama did bring up uh, uh, a possible option five, which... Um, I've kind of indicated too where the uh, council meetings could be in the evening uh, and the committee of the whole uh, during the day. Um, but also look at every third week instead of like uh, option four, we have a meeting every two weeks. Um, if uh, we do the uh, option where the, the council meetings are, are in the evening and the committee of the whole during the day, uh, well, actually, option four has the committee of the whole meetings once a month. Um, if that's a part, if, if I would probably uh, be in favor of uh, um, if we can miss one day a week, if, if anybody who's working during a day and and uh, probably would be able to uh, have one day off during during the month for a, a, a day meeting, uh, but have our council meetings in the evening. Um, I'd like to have a discussion about that uh, possibility. Thank you, Councillor Bernal. Councillor Loka, anything to add? Uh, I really, uh, through you, Your Worship, I really don't have an opinion on any of this. Uh, my life is not affected uh, since I'm fully retired. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'm taking everything in of... Uh, of what my fellow council has to say and, and we'll see where, uh, where it goes, but I really have no opinion. So okay. thank you. Okay. Thanks councilor Loka. Um, that leaves myself. A um, couple of points I just want to bring up. First of all, um, neighboring municipalities are, are all working on evening meetings um, because the vast majority of the people that uh, are on their council have full-time employment uh, because this is, technically a part-time job and uh and it's difficult to live on this salary so there's a number of us including myself that uh, have other jobs um that i'm not prepared at this point in time to uh, to let go um and and taking up uh you know it's a significant amount of time uh every month uh combined with our county responsibilities uh that makes it difficult uh and i know that uh spend a lot of vacation time uh, in uh, to uh, to account for this. Um, I think the evening meeting um, as a, a benefits on a number of, first of all, I'm not in favor of some of the options here that have a meeting 
one morning, one afternoon. I'd, I'd rather see, frankly, one time. Um, I think that the, the constituents are going to get confused uh, trying to figure out which meeting is, you know, I don't know who, who in the, how many people know the difference between in, in, the, in the public, a regular meeting, a council, and a committee of the whole. I mean, most people are like, well, are you meeting or are you not meeting? When are you meeting? When can I go? So I'm in favor, first of all, of having a specific time, be it six, be it seven, as Penetang is seven, I believe, um, uh, Midland as well. And so that's what we meet every, every every two Wednesdays or every one Wednesday a month. I, I'm, I'm open on that. I don't have a problem with that. Um, I also think that uh, uh, maybe splitting up the meetings, I know that we're, we to, to, to deal with the workload. I know we're just starting, so we don't have a uh, defer to Councillor Walma in terms of, I know we're probably a little bit slower than people that have been doing this for a while. Um, certainly that we will go, we'll speed up and be more expedient and more efficient as we go forward. Um, and actually I see a benefit of that of being an evening meeting. Um, you know, the, the, you know I, don't, I don't see any diminished uh, performance capabilities because we're, we're all grown adults. We're not gonna get tired. We're, uh, we've been working. Be ready for the meeting, um, but knowing that you have a hard stop, in most cases, I think will uh, will force us indirectly and, and in a more efficient way, and benefit of all of us to get things done quicker and more uh, more efficiently. So, um, those are my thoughts on it. I, uh, I, I as I said, I, I prefer a, an evening meeting, um, both personally uh, for my own situation, and uh, I believe in the from the township perspective, uh, it's 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 allows a greater opportunity for people to participate, be it virtually or or in person. Uh, and having, again, having one specific time, uh, the frequency I'm, I'm open to uh, during the month is something that I uh, I think would be beneficial to, uh, to the residents of Tiny. Thank you, Councillor Walma, please. Uh, thank you, Worship. I can see that I'm slowly losing this argument. So I'm gonna offer an alternative. Um, <laughs> the uh, um, so going back to what you said, keeping it standard, I get. I also have heard the argument, and I have a very similar one. It's that this is paid as a part-time job, and people expect us to do a lot more uh, than part-time hours. Uh, so the uh, I, I get that completely. Could I offer the idea of potentially changing the days of our meetings uh, from the Wednesday? to the same days as the county council meetings, uh, which would mean that it would be one day off. Uh, we have the meeting uh, at 1 p.m., Committee of the Whole, and we have our council meeting at 6 p.m. It would be a half day off for uh, Councilor Brunel, and we can uh, eliminate that extra meeting that we've talked about by going from uh, to two meetings a month, having your, the Committee of the Whole council. So it's one o'clock, Committee of the Whole, 6 p.m., Council, same day as County Council. 99% of the time, County Council is done by noon. Uh, so you guys would be able to get back from that. It means that you're doing one agenda-heavy weekend, which you're already going to do anyway, with the meetings being separated by a Tuesday, Wednesday. I, uh, I There may be other concerns that I haven't thought about in that regard, and I'm happy to to, to listen to those, but... Uh, uh, something for consideration because i seriously dislike the we'll call it the morale effect of the 6 p.m for me specifically and i would suggest that staff would have some of those similar things from an accessibility standpoint i know that uh, that people say that they're going to come to council meetings i've been doing this for eight years and people don't come to council meetings <laughs> they they don't they, they, it's good to have the option and the option is there. If it's important to them, they will find a way to get there, especially if they can zoom in. So that is, those are my, my comments. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Councillor Walma. We have option five. So further discussion, Councillor Brunel, please. Actually option six. <laughs> um, when uh, are the County Council, uh, County of, uh, sorry, County Simcoe, uh, council meetings uh, are they once a month? Like, what, what's the schedule for them? Um, well, there, there's we do have a schedule. Obviously, I can show you the exact dates. The uh, basically they're every two weeks. Every two weeks. Uh, okay. With uh, they're more frequent uh, on a on a more intensive basis than than township meetings. 
but they do have break periods. So like during Christmas, December, I believe during, you've got it January there, like there's some months, December doesn't have any meetings, July doesn't have any meetings, but otherwise you're looking, uh, like in my case, I'm on a couple committees, um, like in the month of January, I'm in three all day meetings already, all in the same day. So uh, February will be three again, March two, April two, May three, uh, June three. So roughly uh, there, there's 20 meetings uh, for each um, each committee. Uh, yeah, moving forward. So it's it's fairly intensive. If they, if, I hope they go till noon. Uh, that would be nice. I haven't had one of those yet, but they uh, even yesterday we had a meeting and it was that was purely informational and it still went to four thirty, starting at nine. So keep in mind too, it's a larger council. There's forty four participants. So, Councillor Wama, please. Just very quickly, I wanted to say yes. At the beginning, there is a lot more to digest. It's a it's a it's a catch up. There's more reports, but I, like I would argue that once you get first quarter in the meetings jump back to a very manageable half day so okay good okay councillor bernal please you continue so um we don't want to set up the mayor and deputy mayor to kind of okay you know i gotta leave at noon if they have to stick around for whatever or just i have to leave sorry to go like it's uh that I like the idea about the one o'clock, six o'clock. I I I, I kind of like that idea because um, it, it kind of accommodates staff also. That okay, you know, it's I, you know, it, I think if they had an uh, alternative of either a one o'clock or six o'clock, they probably rather have a one o'clock. We want staff uh, involved in the committee of, of the whole meetings for sure. Like what we've done, it's it's great. Um, I'm not saying no to this idea. Just the idea about having it piggyback to the county council meetings. Uh, now. How often do we want? What's the, how often do we want the committee of the whole meetings uh, uh, and count, uh, and our council meetings to occur once every three weeks or once a month? If it's once a month, um, again, uh, to take a one afternoon off a month, uh, uh, not and and not considering other committee meetings uh, uh, that we have to attend, um, is doable. I think in, in most situations, uh, probably in my situation, but uh, I like that idea about the, the one o'clock. Great, thanks, Councillor Bernal. Further comments, Deputy Mayor Miskins. Thank you, through your your worship. Um, I guess my only comment is um, if a County of Simcoe meeting goes longer, what's the process for delaying um, a committee of the whole meeting, um, if, if it's truly to start at one o'clock, I'm just thinking if we've got a particular and we don't know the agendas in advance. So, you know, it's nice to say that they, they're going to end at noon. What if we've got a really contentious issue or something that needs to be brought up in the moment? And Mayor Evans and I are looking at each other going, it's 12 o'clock. We've got a, we got a scoot, but we're in the middle of a, of a huge debate. And, you know, our representation effectively leaves um, the county meeting um, when we leave. Um, and I'm just wondering what the procedural, I guess, and this might be for uh, for the clerk or for CAO Lamb to jump in here. What is the procedure for delaying a meeting when we have the the statutory public notice um, that needs to go out and stuff? I just want to make sure that we're we're you know taking into consideration any risk principles um, as part of our uh, our discussion here today. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, CAO Lamb or Madam Clerk, would like to jump in on that? I realize it's kind of hypothetical, but uh... yeah, thank you, Mayor Evans. So uh, yeah, that de definitely does um, potentially cause some issues uh, for the mayor and deputy mayor to get back in time if um, they decide to align the meeting schedule with the county council. Um, I think that could be a little risky because you don't really know how the meetings are going to go. So um, I think if we're in a position um, that um, Council decides to align with those meetings. Um, maybe a later start time would be um, a better thought, perhaps, as opposed to um, assuming that the meeting at the county council is going to end at noon. And you have to be back here by one. Uh, that's pretty tight for the uh, the mayor and deputy mayor. Okay. Thank you. Further discussion. 
I think we're all Councillor Mona. I was going to say, it doesn't have to be yeah. to Councillor Brunel's point on those days. If yep. you guys see that as an issue, uh, it was uh, a recommendation to make it easier on your work schedules was to get mm -hmm. two birds in one stone. Uh, that being said, from a person, uh, you'll note that people get up and leave from county council meetings when they have other not even council meetings to go to and attend. So you have that uh, discretion. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would just, again, say that it's a rarity. And if there was something important, we can roll with it. Sometimes there's not a whole lot of meeting uh, at a tiny township meeting and there's still quorum with three of us. So mm -hmm. uh, uh, it is doable is what I'm getting at. Maybe not ideal. Yep. Okay. Councillor Bruno. Um, yeah, possibly at two o'clock on those back-to-back -back days. Uh, uh, so yeah, one o'clock doesn't have to be uh, the time. But I think uh, in this case, uh, I think we really need to hear from you, Mayor, about this issue. Uh, kind of a, uh, it looks like there's six options, um, mm -hmm. uh, concepts, um, hypotheticals, one you want to call it. But uh, uh, I think uh, it's important that we hear from you uh, on on this particular issue, because uh, some of us are going to be uh, as very flexible, a little flexible, but maybe not as flexible as uh, as yourself. So, uh, I'd like to hear from you. Well, I think um, I share with you know, the, I do have another full time job, um, although it's fairly flexible. So I'm able to bounce or you know I, I can move things around, um, but it's uh, it, it's difficult sometimes yeah it's it's hard to um to uh to change things and uh i realized we're at the beginning uh where, where it came up was just that the amount of time that we we're frankly uh, a little surprised how much time there was especially on the county level um you know there's i think the the thing that we're we're all four of us are going to find out is that it's not so much these meetings that are the big uh, it's the number of committees that we're on uh and committees both on a simco level and a and a township level um, now, the, most of those are going to be in the you know in the evening or or later on in the afternoon, I hope, or uh, but some of them are during the day as well. So it's uh, I've already found that um, you know my schedule basically every day I've got at least two things that I'm doing, um, which is fine. I have no problem with that. Um, but uh, meetings like the when I looked at again, I look at the other townships. I look up the makeup of their 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 councils. Um, majority of their people are all working as well, uh, and that's why they go to an evening meeting. And um, I saw it as a means of, yeah, certainly it, it would benefit me. Um, it would be easier for me to have an evening meeting starting at six. Um, I'll certainly work within whatever council is just decides as a group. Uh, we 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 agree as a group makes uh, sense for all of us. Uh, but my uh, my uh, Desire is to have these meetings in the evening because I something that I can control. I can't control the county council meetings. I can't change those. So this gives me uh, gives me a little more time to breathe uh, during the day um, moving forward. So uh, my uh, my my uh, I'm I'm all in favor of just based status quo and of what we do in terms of days, uh, but moving it to the evening, frankly. Uh, Councillor Bernal, sorry, anything else? I'd like to know your opinion about a, a one o'clock or two o'clock start once a month for the Committee of the Whole. I, I have no issue with that. I don't see the big difference of that between nine o'clock and one o'clock or two o'clock. Still a day off, you know. Sorry. Or, sorry, sorry. Or or, or six o'clock. Like, like it's either a, a day, either nine o'clock or two o'clock, as opposed to a, a night, six or seven o'clock start. The, the, I would, the, yeah, I would. I, I see middle ground, sir. I, I would prefer a two. Over a nine, yeah, for sure. But still, my preference would be a six. Okay. If okay. we do like a number one, two, three, you know, pros and cons, I would be, I would be six two nine. So maintaining the current standard. Sorry. Thank you. Any other questions? Or yeah. So um, the committee of the whole, what I'm seeing so far, and again, I'm new at this. Um, uh, is the involvement of the staff. It's, I think it's really, really important that uh, uh, they're on, on board uh, on, on what we decide. So if if you're, you know, like, it looks like there's going to be, a, I guess, a, 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 <laughs> a different way of thinking when it comes down to uh, uh, 
staff um, considerations, they'd probably prefer nine o'clock uh, and then second mm -hmm. option, two o'clock and the third option, six o'clock kind of thing. Um, and I'm talking more about a, uh, the business meeting of the, or the community as a whole. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I'm, I'm just want to, just I wanted to point that out, and I think we should maybe allow uh, 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 CEO Lamb to kind of pipe in right now to kind of. Uh, I'd like to hear his thoughts, but if whatever, I'm all for that. Yeah, of course. Um, before we go there, though, uh, Councillor Woman, you have you had your hand up. I'll uh, hold my comment till we okay. have the motion on the floor. Okay. CEO Lamb, do you have anything uh, to add to the discussion as per uh, Councillor uh, Brunel's comments? Uh, first of all, uh, obviously, it'll go without saying. Uh, staff will do whatever council and wishes. We work for council, uh, and and we will. So whatever the schedule is, we will work around that schedule. Absolutely agree, one hundred percent, with Councillor Brunel's comment and the fact that it is imperative that your senior management team and other support staff are there to help, especially with the committee of the whole conversations. Uh, th that is the business meeting of the two. The other is a ratification meeting. Uh, if you're going to the evening uh, with an existing format, that means those staff will all be available. Will all be working until literally eleven o'clock at night. Uh, as long as council is working, we will be working, and of course, we will do our job to the best of our ability at all time. Um, so the obviously we would prefer an earlier time frame if it wasn't nine o'clock uh, one o'clock or two o'clock would certainly allow me to as a CAO to manage my staffing time a little bit differently because maybe we revert and how we do our uh, meeting schedule right now we start with a council meeting and then go to committee the whole if we were doing a daytime start we would probably revert back to having the committee first and then having the council meeting uh, uh, later so that would mean those staff that aren't necessarily needing to be at part of a council meeting would then be able to 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 leave. So, from a staff management, from a overtime management perspective, it certainly would make a afternoon start would make it easier to manage the staffing that would need to be there. If it's a full time evening meeting, all of your senior management staff, the the support that you see on this meeting right now would be on the meeting right through. There will be the occasion, depending on the layout of the meeting, I might be able to send messages to individual staff members that I think they could log off. But most of the time, your directors will be on the call till the very end because we never know when we're required. So, okay. but ultimately, it, but this is this is council's uh, uh, council's decision, uh, and uh, we will support and make work whatever council decides. Great, thank you. Okay, so. Any further, sorry, any further discussion? We're all, so we've got, do we want to articulate, sorry, the fifth and sixth option for consideration? Is this something that, so we'll start with Councillor Brunel. I'm not saying you're fifth or sixth, but if you want to <laughs> propose a, a, a solution that we could uh, consider as another additional option. Well, option five, uh... Would be to have the committee of the whole meetings uh, uh, during the day. Um, let's say I don't know if we can may say nine or one as uh, actually I guess we can maybe combine option five, option six, and one here uh, to have the committee of the whole meetings uh, during the day and the council meetings in the evening, probably the same day. Uh, now we have to talk about okay the like I mentioned already, do we want them every th three weeks or do we want them every uh, once a month? Probably every third Wednesday. Um, uh, so, uh, or we say, uh, yeah, probably, let, let's probably make it nice and easy every third Wednesday um, to have the committee of the whole meetings okay. during the day and uh, council meeting in the evenings. So in terms of difference versus status quo, we're looking at a count, a committee of the whole meeting Starting at well, two o'clock. So I, I guess option five would be at nine o'clock. Op option six would be at let's say uh, let's say two o'clock. Okay. Okay. And otherwise, the scheduling of the meetings, like on, on a calendar basis, would remain as is. Like the the frequency I'm speaking to. If if that's what is best. Oh, no, but part of your option, yours oh, would be yeah. the change, would be the same frequency. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. 
Uh, Deputy Mayor Miskmans, please. Thank you. Through you, Your Worship, just an addendum to, I guess, option six, as uh, Councillor Walma um, had previously stated, is moving those to a day, if we're doing a, a later start time for the Committee of the Whole meeting, being vis-a-vis -vis two o'clock, um, that it should, um, the frequency should coincide with the County of Simcoe um, dates, just from a schedule management, work management perspective, you know, in, in all uh, transparency, if I take a day off, it means I'm working the weekend. So I'm giving up a weekend. Um, and as Mayor Evans did state, this is a part-time job and trying to balance my family life as well, um, you know, becomes more challenging. That means I'm giving up my weekends. Um, so if we can schedule them, that it's all in one day, that I'm not, you know, spending four hours <laughs> where I'm not uh, not working. Um, so I'd rather consolidate it all in one day, balancing, you know, as Councillor Walma did indicate, most county meetings end around noon. Um, but a start time of 2 p.m. gives us now some flexibility should those meetings go over the uh, the noon time frame. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Councillor Bernal, please. And, and that's why I asked about the frequency of the of the county meetings. Um, mm -hmm. So should we have them every two weeks or every four weeks? The county, because because you're saying every oh, two good weeks. Good point. Yeah. Again, I. You have the schedule in front of you for the county meetings there. I can grab it. I may jump in just for a second, Your Worship. Okay, just, Olin, please. Just from an administrative point of view, I would be very concerned about four-week uh, approval processes from a, a council mm -hmm. perspective. So uh, I'd really not like to see that being an option because that really does slow down the business of the municipality and actually may necessitate us calling way more special meetings than we would want to in order to get business done. Uh, and I, I, there was a question asked to uh, the clerk and myself uh, about how would you work it if you were with the county, uh, consolidated it with the county schedule. Um, part of the other considerations that the mayor and the deputy mayor could look at would be depending on whether a county council meeting did carry forward, if there was still a major item, would be coordinating between one of the two of you to stay at the county meeting till it was done, the other came back, so we still had a township representative at that potential vote of a, a county council meeting and then the other member joining our meeting whenever that is done and coming through so that's one of the other considerations is balancing off the items on the agenda you know we may not always have two representatives there uh we might leave uh, one behind to talk on our interests at the county level as well okay thank you for the comments CILM. yeah the um uh, sorry my madam clerk please uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Evans, um, and perhaps uh, maybe Robert can come on screen as well, because um, just another item with regards to aligning with the county schedule, I'm not sure how often they have the county council. I know that we do have a copy of the schedule for 2023. Um, one of the things um, that uh, we did kind of move away from was having um, four meetings a month every other week, um, and that was, um, so that's why we moved to every um, third Wednesday. Uh, it just provided staff an opportunity to get out of the cycle of um, being in a constant cycle of preparing reports, doing follow-up from the council meetings, and having time to do other administrative duties in between meetings, so that extra week uh, afforded that. So, um, I don't know how the county council runs, if it's every um, second week, but that's something to consider as well. And I don't know, Robert, if you have a comment on that. Yeah, uh, thank you for you, you Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, the, the clerk does bring out the efficiency point of view from a staffing perspective. We, we had found of all the schedules when we went to that three week rotation was the most efficient for staff because the same people that are on the meeting are the same people that are preparing the reports that are also the same people making sure <laughs> That, that direction is carried out. Uh, although given the various options, if if we if three weeks is preferable, but if it meant we had to go to two weeks, again, we would uh we would work with that. But I do think it's I, I think it's important that that we have whatever combination we look at, if we can make sure that there is a council meeting on the day we're having that committee meeting, we can at least get whatever the work is ratified from either two weeks or three weeks prior to that so that it can actually come into effect. Great. Thanks, CLM. Uh, Councillor Walmart, please. Thank you, Your Worship. Through you, 
Um, so we've talked about, uh, I guess one of the other ones that I'm going to talk about was a work-life balance slash overtime cost for staff. And this is a question to, I guess, the CAO. If, uh, if we do opt to go to an evening uh, style meeting, uh, I guess our current policy uh, for senior management would, uh, it's just extra time. Uh, if council was, uh, I don't know, uh, willing to uh, basically give a half day or a three hour uh, kind of thing the following day after every council meeting, would that is that something within our ability to do so? Does it decrease our capacity as a municipality? I'm just... To me, there's a huge component of the of the work life balance, not just for council but for staff as well. So, uh, comments, please. Uh, through you, uh, your worship. So yes, uh, part of the challenge with being able to say you just automatically would be off the next morning is that often the day after the council meeting is our busiest day, uh, as we are now making sure everything is being done. Uh, letters are being read, and emails are being sent, contracts are being dealt with. Uh, and depending again who is at the meeting as far as support staff is to how depleted a particular department could be uh, and especially if you're getting into a meeting schedule that uh, uh, we will have vacations uh, from support staff and the rest of us so it, it 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 would be nice to be able to say we would automatically just give people the next morning off to be able to compensate for that but if from a practical point of view that may not be feasible in all departments because of our limited staffing levels that we have here. Thank you, CAOLM. Councillor Brunel, please. Yes, on that point, a couple of things. Uh, how are other municipalities that who have evenings, uh, meetings in the evenings, how are they dealing with that particular issue? Um, and maybe second uh, question is, what about the morning of the day of the meeting uh, to have this, uh, if it's at two o'clock, maybe perhaps just come in at 12 uh, or 11 uh, to do the last minute things, but you would think things would get pretty well done before the, the day of the meetings. Uh, so to be here that uh, at nine o'clock to, to do things for the meeting, uh, probably not necessary, but maybe in the morning of uh, automatic three hours off or whatever the amount is uh, is consideration, but I'd just like to know what other municipalities are, are how are they dealing with this overtime issue? Okay, Councillor Brunel, thank you. Um, Councillor Holoka, please. Just so I'm clear uh, through you, Your Worship. Please. It. I think it's mathematically difficult to pair up a County of Simcoe meeting every two weeks with our meetings every three weeks. Is, am I getting that straight? That's correct. Yeah, Matt, you're right. Mathematically, you're not going to never, well, obviously you're not going to match one to one. So you're going to, some weeks you will mathematically, but uh, every fourth time you'll hit, yes. So my recommendation would be what, whatever route we decide to go would be to separate the county of Simcoe from the needs of the township of Tiny. So that if, is it possible for only one of you to go to a county of Simcoe meeting or for you guys to alternate or do you feel that you both need to be there? Um. Well, I can, I'll let Deputy Mayor Miskimmons uh, follow up, but in, in, from my per, uh, perspective, um, I have actually, I have a, an additional position on the County of Simcoe as Vice Chair of Corporate Performance Committee. So um, that is something that has to be performed by myself. Uh, nobody else can perform that. Um, not that it's going to be hugely onerous, I don't believe, but there will be opportunities where I'm going to have to be, you know, chair of the meeting and stuff like that. So, um, and I'll let Deputy Mayor Miskim and speak to his uh, position. Yeah, I th thank you through you, your worship. So good point, uh, Councillor Holoka. I mean, at the end of the day, then, as we've discussed uh, at a previous uh, agenda item, uh, sorry, Councillor Holoka, can you just mute yourself for a second? I think I'm picking, getting picked up there. Um, we would have to send our alternate um, to that meeting if only one of us is going to be there. And uh, as Mayor Evans said, he is the vice chair of the Corporate Performance Committee. So he is required 
um, to be there because uh, he may be in fact chairing that meeting um, at any given point. And again, the agenda, given we have a public statutory notice we need to give, we're trying to balance all of this stuff. I think, you know, to your, your point earlier, it's mathematically impossible to, uh, to do and that just creates even further challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Councillor Mama, please. And then Councillor. Uh, Thank no. you, Worship. I just want to say I like the idea and the tra th train of thought, but it is definitely important to have both members there. If you send one home, uh, you, you still have representation. Unfortunately, it's uh, there is a, a weighted vote system there, so you you still technically do lose uh, some of your voice when the, that member goes home. So, good point. Thank you, Councillor Bruno. Please. Uh, the option four suggested from our staff that the community of the whole meetings would be on the second Wednesday of the month, which would be basically once every four weeks. Uh, that's where it could, again, every four weeks, it'd be a county council meeting. So we would be able to hit that mark. Uh, if we remove ourselves from a three week cycle to a four week cycle, which was suggested in option four uh, for the community of the whole meetings. Question is, is that going to be enough? Uh, is that going to be a, 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 a enough committee of the whole meetings throughout the year, 12 of them, um, to do the count, uh, township business? Thanks, Councillor Bruno. Um, I know we're trying to do a lot to try and tie up Simcoe and Tiny on a on a schedule that makes difference but just even eyeballing the schedule when i'm looking at it here it doesn't even run every three weeks it's it's all over the board frankly um they're every two weeks but they they do move around so i'm not personally i think we're kind of chasing our tails here trying to trying to make these two mathematically come together and given the fact that you know we have a we have a special kind of meeting next week on the 18th these are these are going to happen right and we're going to happen and we just had the county meeting get changed last week too, from the 24th to 31st. So, and that we got to be prepared for that. That's going to happen. And we want to be able to have special meetings and things pop up and stuff like that. So uh, I think we should, you know, as a uh, personally, I think as a council, we should look back to like, okay, well, look back to the beginning here. We've got status quo and what is it that, uh, what's the real issue here? And what's what's really going on? And the fact is, is that a couple of us, uh, you know, it, it's taking a lot of time from our work schedule uh, to do this uh, all day, um, every three weeks. So, uh, and uh, again, I, I believe that, uh, you know, that, that other councils uh, that I know of are already doing uh, six Midland and Penetang are seven o'clock um, and, and Tay as well. So they're, you know, uh, and their, their makeup is, you know, some so similar to ours. So I'm, I'm looking at going like there are advantages. There's advantages to, I, I frankly wish I didn't have to go to the other job. Sometimes it gets, you know, come in at nine o'clock, no problem. I have no problem with it. But uh, the reality is, is that uh, um, I do and I have to, and I want to keep the other job. And uh, uh, so now I'm just we're trying to find a way that, uh, that works to satisfy all. And uh, I know that uh, the last council, uh, previous council, I and mean, even not as many people work full or had full time employment, and, and uh, now we're in that position. So, that to me, that's where it really came from is to try and uh, balance the, the needs of uh, working needs of, uh, of 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 council with uh, with a part time job. And um, and I'm I'm totally about work life balance. I, I totally get that, and uh, I want to not just for for council, but for staff and uh, in the public as well. And, and increase public accessibility. So, um, so there I'm at. I, I I wish I had a panacea here to to solve this. I really don't. Um, you know, I uh, we just we do raises for all of council so that we don't have to have other jobs. <laughs> uh, hopefully, Director LeBlanc didn't hear that. <laughs> Deputy Mayor Miskimans, please. Thank you, through you, Your Worship. Just a thought here. Are we are we looking at this maybe um, too uh, in too much of a linear fashion? Is it possible, given you know our council meetings are pretty much just approving everything that we've discussed? Do we sort this out in a way that we offset? 
Committee of the Whole from Council? Do they need to be tied together, I guess, is the question. Do we, you know, move a council meeting to, you know, five o'clock at night, knowing that in most cases it's an hour. Um, so the impacts to staff time are minimal. We're minimizing that. Um, we're also minimizing any other commitments that we have, you know, our day jobs that pay the bills um, at the end of the day. Um, doesn't impact nighttime, evening schedules with kids and getting them to bed and stuff. I'm just trying to think a little bit outside the box here that we separate these. You know, if we do decide that we're going to do committee of whole at, uh, at a 6 p.m., we're not, you know, starting off with council and, you know, we're extending into the 11 o'clock range. We may be able to, if we separate it, do council one night, we're done in an hour, hour and a half tops. You know, we have our committee the whole meeting. If we do a 6 p.m., you know, I, I like the idea of time pressures, right? If we're all looking at the clock, we're, we're getting more efficient. It's like the whole stand-up meeting thing, right? You remove the chairs around a table and have a meeting. Things get done quicker. You sit down and things just prolong. I'm just wondering if we need to rethink kind of that model while still considering staff time, um, our own time, efficiencies, and all of that. So I just... I know we've been talking about this to death, but I just, it came to me and I thought, let's just unbuckle these two things and see if they, if they have to be combined or not. So I open that one up. No, thanks for the comments. And yeah, but this will may take a long time to discuss, but that's okay. That's, that's, you know, we want to come up with the best solution and some, that's why we're, and as public is aware, this is the only time that we get to sit as a group and discuss this. So some things are going to take a long time and that's okay. We want to try and come up with a solution that, that, Best fits all of us. So, Councillor Brunel, please. So, uh, Councillor uh, Deputy Mayor Meskimins, um, uh, so you're in, uh, in favor of option four. Basically, that's what you're re reverting back to. Sorry, did you have anything else, Councillor Brunel? Oh, okay, sorry, just uh, stop there. You're continuing on. Thank you, Councilman, Deputy Mayor Miskimans. Thank you, through your worship. I guess it's it's option four with a twist, right? Because again, these things look like they're they're buckled or they're really far apart. Um, so what if we were to do, say, and this is just I'm throwing this out for f food for thought. So if we were to say we're going to move committee of the whole meetings to a Tuesday evening, six p.m. start time, you know, we go till you know eleven at the latest. Um, hopefully not. Who's to say we couldn't do a, a council meeting on the Wednesday right after at a 5 p.m. start time and, and take care of business that way? I'm, I'm just trying to think a little bit outside of the box that it doesn't need to, you know, we don't need the weeks in between necessarily if all we're doing in a council meeting is confirming what's already been discussed through the committee of the whole, understanding that we would always lag kind of that three week cycle um, in between a committee of the whole to the point where we vote on that might be a, a three week interval. Um, so just, just some thoughts there. Okay. So just to just confirm then option four, five and 6 PM, right? You said five for the regular meeting and six for the, uh, on a different day. Correct. Still doesn't it doesn't you know it's still not alleviating the concerns of people that don't want an evening meeting, but it, hopefully the evening meeting is shorter because of the virtue of it being split. Okay, Councilor Wama. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. <clears throat> uh, through you, my my opinion is a meeting is a meeting is a meeting, and we have. Uh, uh, you'll you'll note when we start doing committee meetings that uh, oh the meeting only took an hour well that's the amount of time that you were there you also have to prep for the meeting get to the meeting be there for the meeting get home for the meeting so I actually one of my pet peeves was that oh you only had one meeting today so you should have had lots of time my my wife hits me with that all the time and <laughs> you love you Morgan the <laughs> is that. Uh, it, there's a lot more to all of those meetings than just the time you were there. Um, so with that said, I appreciate the, uh, the creativity, uh, but I would actually, in that regard, I'd even prefer option three. It keeps our status quo of the every three Wednesdays, and we just have a really, depending on who you are for me, a really terrible one-time deal. <laughs> 
and get it done. Um, so the I I I, I guess we've tr we've talked it out. In my opinion, we've talked it out. Combining with the county council meetings, while is a strategic nightmare and has some potential uh, shortcomings, so I'm happy to concede that it was a shot in the dark. Uh, when we do option four, it's more, in my opinion, it's more days that we're here, uh, and it has less uh, less ratification days. So you have one one meeting a month where you're actually passing or moving the business the other one is just recommendations so i personally if we're if we're gonna if it, if evening meetings are happening i personally would prefer option three thank you thank you councillor woman deputy mary miskins Thank you three your worship uh thanks councillor Walma. i agree as a musician um people just want to pay us for the gig and go why are you so high when they don't realize the amount of time that goes into perfecting the craft rehearsing jamming working through things so fully appreciate a meeting is a meeting is a meeting um i would agree then i'm 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 okay with option three as well that uh you know we were seems to maybe be the best um overall solution given um all the complexities um, that we're trying to to work through, uh, maintain public uh, accessibility to us, allows us to continue to uh, do our day jobs that pay the bills, allows us to uh, to continue to advance business forward in an expedient uh, fashion, and uh, also allows us, uh, well, three of us, I guess, now at the table um, to continue with county business as well at the same time, um, in case we do need uh, to use the alternate of, of Councillor Walma there. I think that might be a, a better, uh, we're striking a better balance between all the different pressures, external pressures, internal pressures, public pressures um, that were faced. Thanks. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Madam Clerk, please. Yes, thank you, uh, Mayor Evans. I just wanted to confirm, uh, just so Council's uh, aware, that option three is um, basically, again, is if we use this month as uh, an example, so Committee the Whole uh, would take place on the 11th, and then you would not have a council meeting uh, until February 1st. But they would both Thank start at 6 p.m. Sorry, so just if, for, I, just if I could, Madam Clerk, if so I could correct, clarify? sorry, my apologies, in uh, yes, my understanding was that it would be council meeting, Committee the Whole meeting. Uh, we can get really efficient at council meetings. Uh, you'll notice that Dave, uh, sorry, his worship will get really fast at reading motions. Um, so I, I think that we can do both and uh, and keep that uh, um, keep the existing model only starting at six. So if I may, then that that would be um, option two. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Council, everybody clear on, I know we had six options. We're back to two. So sorry, we're back to four. So we're, uh, Councilor Brunel, please. I just wanna get clarification on option three. So it, are, are, you, are you saying that the committee of the whole meetings would have been every six weeks? Like. It, I, I just want to get clarification on option three from I, sorry, through you. I was wrong. Option two. Yes, 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 yes. No, no, I, I, I agree with what uh, is going on here, but I just want to get clarification on option three. Is that the, our, the suggestion was to have a committee of the whole meeting every six weeks through you, Mary Evans, to the clerk? Madam Clerk? Uh, thank you. So if I look at the schedule uh, that... Uh... That looks like that's what it would equate to. So you would have your um, committee of the whole would be January the 11th, regular meeting of council would be February 1st, and then the next committee of the whole would not be until the 22nd of February. That's for option three. Councillor Bernal, any supplemental on that or you good? Yes, I'm good for now. Okay, thank you. Further discussion, Deputy Mayor, please. Thank you, three year worship. So just to con just to confirm understanding of option two. Mm -hmm. Option two is basically status quo with the exception of the shift in time start time for the meetings. We're still progressing. We still have the same amount of meetings. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a time shift for um, a later start. 
That's my understanding. Is that to be uh, confirmed, Madam Clerk? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Thanks. So it's just for the public's perception because <laughs> we've, and, yeah. we've got a lot of different places. So I just wanted to clarify for the public here. Yeah, absolutely. And if I just may include that, that's correct. It's just a shift to 6 p.m. Everything remains status quo. The only change would be that the planning public Planet. meeting would have to be on a separate date. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Clerk. If, if I may, Your Worship, the other... CILM, please. Sorry. The, so th with that option, the other thing that has, council would have to take into consideration is how do we deal with unfinished business if we do not get through the agenda by the 11 o'clock uh, hard stop? Uh, we would be having to, at some point, uh, schedule a meeting to finish off that uh, agenda. Um, it is not uncommon in, uh, for us to have six-hour committee meetings. Council meetings tend to be very quick, but a six-hour uh, a committee meeting is kind of general course of business as we get rolling. Uh, so that would literally take us to midnight or beyond. So I do see envision situations where the 11 o'clock hard stop would mean there would be multiple items not dealt with potentially that would have to be somehow a new meeting scheduled, public notice given and uh, be able to come back and circle back to the items that we haven't completed. So I just want to make sure council is aware during the thought process that we would still have to to do that. Thank you, CAOLM. You sure that? Councillor Holoka, please. Well, through you, Your Worship, uh, having listened to everybody and uh, everybody's concerns, and uh, just with uh, CAO Lamb's recent comments, could we move the uh, take option two and move it from 9 a.m. to, say, 4 p.m., a 4 p.m. start or a 5 p.m. start? Um, I'm just throwing that out there. Uh, and then we could uh, play it, uh, you know, and see how it goes. And if we're getting all the business done, you know, then we can leave it as status quo. But if there's unfinished business, then we could push it back to 5 p.m. or 4 p.m. Uh, to start the committee of the whole meetings. That's my, uh, that's my recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Holoka. Comments? Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, on, that, on that, if you went to that style of model, what you could still do is kind of as we did with the deputation today, where there's a hard fixed time. If we were starting, at, let's use four o'clock as an example, we started the committee meeting at four and you went to a hard stop at six, held the council meeting to ratify the business. Once that business is adjourned, you re-pick up your committee meeting and carry on or your public planning meeting it would allow some potential flexibility, uh, but you have a hard scheduled council meeting time period so you can get the business ratified every three weeks and then still allows you more flexibility to get committee work done. Thank you, CLN. I'm seeing some nodding heads, that's good. That's good. good. Would you like to uh, council start the uh, process of putting together a Proposed motion. I'm sorry. Just to clarify, the uh, idea would be that we started for, or the four o'clock session is only if that, I don't. I, I'm not even. I didn't discussion on the time. I, I, four o'clock is your proposed. Uh, not my proposal. No, I would. Uh, Four thirty would be better for me, just because kids and buses. But. Five o'clock, sure. Five o'clock. <laughs> Five o'clock would be uh, Councillor Burnell. Five o'clock works for me. Okay. And I think it would work uh, better than six. Okay. It, it does for me too. Um, appreciate that. Um, and option two with a. CAOLM, just to jump in here, if, if you can see option two, is there anything that we need to add to that? Uh, in a, uh, again, yeah. uh, just what you were referring to there? Or? Yeah, if, you, if you were going to your worship to the option two scenario, then I would stick with five o'clock being, if it's a five o'clock start you're doing, 
you have your council meeting at five o'clock, then you go into your committee business. So you wouldn't start for an hour and then go back. I would, you would just keep option two and change it to the uh, council meeting would start at five, followed by the uh, committee, the whole meeting with a hard stop of 11, unless there's a resolution to council to continue, so. Okay. Um, do you wanna have one final go around? Anybody want to comment? Any last comments? I'm seeing no. No. Councillor Walma, please. And just to clarify, because I'm thinking about the upcoming schedule, that we ratify this in three weeks, and then it would be initiated for the following meeting, asking the clerk. Through. Madam Clerk. Evans, thank you. So yes. um, in the report, it does speak to the timeline. So um, direction will be given today. It'll be ratified on the 1st, and then the changes would come forward. Uh, we do the public notice, and then the changes uh, through a procedure bylaw would come forward on February 22nd for council uh, to ratify. And sorry to clarify again, we have to pass the procedural before we can make the adjustment and that would be another three weeks. Yeah, the procedure bylaw would be approved on the 22nd. That would come forward on the 22nd for approval. So, so it'll start in March. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay, thank you. Two meetings, yeah. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Councilor Walma, anything else further? Okay, good. Councilor Holoka. Yeah, I don't know uh, through you, Your Worship. I don't know if this is the point where I've heard uh, a few times about uh, summer recess or, um, I mean, if we're already going into March, is our schedule take us right through the summer? Uh, I'll defer to Madam Clerk, but I believe it does. Yeah, thank you, um, Mr. Mayor Evans. So um, as you'll note in the report, if we stick to the three-week rotation, that eliminates the need for a summer recess. Thank Anything you. Councillor no. no, thank you. Which I, I totally agree with. I don't think we should be taking recess in summer. Councillor Woma. Thank you, Your Worship. That was gonna be my my next comment once we figured out our thing I wanted to discuss the summer recess. And uh, I guess at the same time, have a quick discussion about our town hall meetings, because I think that uh, the when we have our town hall meetings, it's there's lots of uh, it's about public engagement. Uh, the council's still there um, and it may be as simple as eliminating a portion of uh, we've done this in the past where August has had uh, I don't know if it was August or July. So I stand to be corrected. But instead of having both meetings, we had a committee of the whole and a council, not a committee of the whole council, committee of the whole council. So it eliminated some of that. What I was going to suggest is that there's a lot of planning and stuff that goes into our town hall meetings. It's still the same staff. It's still us that are going to those things. So maybe some consideration if we are going to do a town hall in one of the summer months, that that be considered uh, our meeting. Uh, we don't have to schedule a meeting in that particular time. I st we still have the same visibility and access to the public, which is the priority. And uh, again, if something does arise uh, that requires uh, us to act right away, the mayor uh, or deputy mayor in his stead can call an emergency meeting. So I I still think that uh, I'd like to have that open that discussion for uh, Kelly or sorry, Councillor Holoka's uh, comment about the, the the year-long schedule, if you will. Okay, fair enough. Thank you, Councillor Wilma. Um, before we move on to town hall, though, Madam Clerk, should we put together a motion and put the... I'm sure you're nodding your head there. I think we've... Oh, um... Point of order, though. Point of order. If we ratify the motions, Certainly. if we ratify the motion now uh, or make the recommendation now, and then we decide because of town halls, we have to change the previous motion. That's why I was wondering, uh, Director Walton, if we should have the town hall discussion now, as I think it's germane to the discussion. Good point. I just wonder, though, are we going to put dates on town hall at this point in time? So is it something that we can change later? Like town halls being... 
I, I have no, I, no sir, so, uh, I'm, well, I have no issue either way. You raise a good point. We can deal with it later. Cool. Kick the can. <laughs> Okay, and if I may, uh, Mayor Evans, um, with, regard, with regards to the um, uh, the resolution, sorry. So uh, I believe it was option two that council is looking at with the uh, the only change there is that it would be a 5 p.m. start as opposed to 6 p.m. start. That is correct. Okay, thank you. All right, council. I have before me recommendation, uh, clerk's report CR-02-23 regarding the 2023 20, council and committee meeting schedule be received and that council supports option two with regular meeting of council to start at 5 p.m. Committee of the whole meeting to immediately follow and that the planning public meetings be scheduled on a separate day accordingly. Can I have a mover, please? Councillor Holoka. Seconded by Deputy Mayor Miskimans. All those in favor? Sorry. Those opposed? Your Worship, if I may. Councilor Walmart, please. Just wanted to say the opposition was based on that. I still think that the daytime meeting was uh, what I wanted. Yep. Uh, however, I, I do appreciate the uh, the discussion and debate and think we landed at a very amenable option. I found the whole process very gratifying, frankly, that uh, it was a difficult issue. And we have uh, some very divergent opinions and, and valid opinions on both sides, but we're able to look through it and come up with a solution. And uh, frankly, uh, if it, if this doesn't work out or we find that it changes in the future, there's no reason why we can't reevaluate it later. And uh, I, I, the overriding goal is that uh, this, like a lot of our issues are gonna be tough sometimes and it will take a lot of work. Um, but we're a lot further ahead than where we were when we started. And uh, that's a good thing. That's good that people are able to work together and, and come up with things in tough situations. So I appreciate everybody's support. Um, this was not a recorded vote. You didn't have to put your hand up, <laughs> but I appreciate you did. Thank you. So the motion is carried uh, and uh, move forward to uh, town halls. So... This is with regards to item F 2.5, uh, clerk's report uh, for uh, 2023 town hall meetings. Um, I believe the clerk has a, a, a little bit of a synopsis I read last night uh, about what's been done in the past. And then we'll get an opportunity to, uh, uh, is this something, sorry, before I get ahead, Madam Clerk, is this somewhere? We should take a break. Is this something that uh, for lunchtime or is anybody looking for a, a break at all? Or should we a five minute break? Okay, well, we'll have a, kind of a motion for a five minute break to begin at, well, we're, we're 12.37. Uh, why don't we come back at uh, 12.45? Okay, uh, forwarded by Councillor Holoka. Seconded by Councillor Brunel. Those in favor? All carried. Thank you. We'll see you at 1245.
audio looks like you've go to chat and uh come you didn't get the message i got steph's message yeah yeah that's about fun. the lunch yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> or dinner better be included yeah yeah yes sir you're live right now I think we're ready. Great. Welcome back, everybody. Sorry for a little bit of a delay. Um, the meeting will reconvene at 12.57 p.m. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Holoka. Seconded by Deputy Mayor Miskimans. All in favor? It's passed. Okay. <clears throat> we'll move on to uh, item F2.5, which is uh, clerk's report uh, CR00323 or 2002. Three 2023 town hall meetings. Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mayor Evans. Um, so what you have before you is uh, uh, just a report that outlines the previous format for the town hall meetings. So um, the town hall meetings were implemented in 2015 and were initially scheduled three times a year, spring, summer, and fall. The meetings rotated between township facilities with one meeting being held during the week from 7 to 9 p.m. and the two um, other meetings being held on Saturdays between 10 to 12, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. And the idea was to rotate um, throughout the uh, township facilities uh, to uh, make it convenient for residents and also <clears throat> to have them on Saturdays to also make it convenient for residents who uh, work during the week. Uh, the following year, it was determined that two town hall meetings were adequate, adequate, with one being held in the spring and one in the fall, again rotating between facilities and one in the evening and one on a Saturday. Um, in addition, uh, the town hall meetings, um, the format basically um, was to um, allow council to provide updates to the community and also basically kind of have like an open mic forum where members of the community could um, uh, speak to council on any matter really related to the township and um, <clears throat> provide any comments. Um, in addition to that, we did um, uh, invite um, various uh, organizations and our advisory committees of councils to set up informational tables for um, the public to view and to get updates on the committee activity and also um, activities of um, like the health unit, uh, Severn Sound uh, Environmental Association, North Central Community Futures. We had the um, ec economic development uh, attend as well and things of that nature. Uh, staff commitment to carry out the town halls under the existing format is extensive from coordinating the informational tables, drafting and finalizing speaking notes for council updates, agenda preparation, communication pan campaign, arranging for refreshments, facility preparation, and then dismantling and clearing up after the event. They're based, as I noted, on council updates and on a question and answer period of the community. 
And generally, uh, all members of council did attend these. And in addition, the senior management team and any additional staff were required to attend uh, to assist in any public inquiries if needed. Um, we also attached to the report, I did provide the uh, terms of reference and guidelines uh, that were set out for the uh, current format. Um, so basically, it's an informal meeting of council where no uh, business is, is advanced. <clears throat> it sets out the guidelines and expectations of anyone addressing council. Um, and again, um, members of the public could speak on any subject that council was unable to discuss anything dealing with an identifiable in individual, any legal matters, or anything, um, any other item dealt under the meeting exceptions under the Municipal Act. Um, so that's pretty much in a nutshell. So I guess basically uh, what staff is asking is um, for direction in terms of the town hall meetings going forward and what uh, council would like to see in that regard, if they wish to continue with the format that's here or if they have any changes in mind. Great. Thanks, Madam Clerk. Um, kick off the discussion. Councillor Walma, please, and then Councillor Bruno. Uh, thank you, Worship, through you. I uh, just wanted to say that uh, uh, all of the town halls that I uh, attended, the format that we had was great. It was dynamic. Uh, the uh, we, we changed things uh, a couple times as we went through. Uh, generally, what would happen, the mayor would uh, open the meeting. Every member of council would uh, be assigned or pick a topic that they wanted to discuss of, uh, of note at that particular time. Uh, then... Uh, uh, then we'd open the floor to, to, to discussion. There was lots of opportunity for the public uh, to interact after the fact. Uh, so you get some one-on-one -on -one time, as well as exposure to a lot of those. Uh, and I'm just basically reiterating what the, the clerk said, but uh, I was just going to say what, what was happening did work. Obviously, we can tweak things as we go along, but unless anyone has any um, crazy ideas, I was just going to say this this model was effective. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Councilor Walma. Uh, Councilor Brunel. <clears throat> yes, my question was, uh, when was there time for interaction with the uh, people that had the, uh, a table? Or, but uh, Stephen, just, uh, Council Walma just answered that question. It was afterwards, if they wanted to linger and, and uh, talk to uh, whoever the economic development uh, people, whoever, Seven Sound, I'm sure going to be there, whoever else. Uh, that's, that's the question I had. So it, it's been answered. Okay. I, I hate, sorry, Deputy Mayor Miskmans, please. Thank you, through your worship. Um, I love this idea. Uh, you know, having attended them in the past, having the opportunity to have given a deputation, I think these are a wonderful engagement opportunity to uh, to connect with the public. And uh, you know, I'm I'm very supportive of continuing this format and understand the constraints. Probably a little better now around not advancing uh, the township business, but uh, I think this is a, a wonderful opportunity to uh, continue to engage. Um, the public and uh you know from my perspective here and what i wrote in my notes is i'd like to see it go back to three um sessions um per year um you know i think this is uh it's an awesome opportunity and the the we know that our uh, our base has changed with just over 60 percent now permanent i think there's even more opportunity now to uh to reach um the community and uh, love the fact that uh you know in the past they've been virtual at least the ones that i attended um the fact that we can move to uh to in person creates a very different dynamic as uh councillor brunel brunel had uh, kind of wanted to weigh in there around that one-on-one -on -one opportunity to to have have um, that connection. So um, love this idea. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Deputy Mayor. Councillor Haluka, please. Yes, through you, Your Worship. I echo uh, the sentiments of uh, Deputy Mayor uh, Ms. Gimmons. Uh, I, I too, as well, have ed attended uh, them in the past and as well have uh, was given the opportunity to speak. Uh, I think it's an excellent uh, way to engage the public. And my only question is, uh, will we be aware of any uh, uh, topics ahead of time? Or is this just as the people approach the microphone, uh, they can ask anything they want and sort of on the fly? Is is that my understanding? Well, for, I'll refer to Councillor Wama just to see what's in the past, but we can certainly do whatever we want to do. So let's Start from the past and then move forward. Uh, I would thank you, Your Worship. I was just going to say, you, we usually know the flavor of what people are going to ask just from 
emails and stuff that we've been getting to date. Um, that being said, uh, anyone that <coughs> approaches the mic uh, could ask council any questions that they so choose. Um, we've also gave them the opportunity to submit a question uh, through a, a comment card so that it can remain anonymous if they don't feel comfortable speaking in public. 99% uh, of the time, it's a very, uh, uh, what's the word? <clears throat> Non-hostile, it's very, but we uh, you, you do encounter one or two uh, that uh, are a little more heated. And I mean, it's just something you got to roll with, but uh, no, it's it's off the cuff. Councillor Loka, is that good? Okay, good. Um, I have a couple of concerns. First is, um, I know in the past, <clears throat> judging, on, I haven't been to one, I, I apologize, but uh, too late for that now, but there's a fair amount of work done by staff to prepare council to be able to present topics to the public. Um, and it's a fairly sizable amount of work that they do to pull all the information together. Um, is that worthwhile? Is it something, uh, uh, frankly, my, I, I see this as a great. I, I certainly, of course, I love the opportunity. I think it's a any. We're all uh, we're all salespeople at art, and we like to meet people and hear what they have to say. <clears throat> so I'm I'm more of the the ilk that I'd like this to be, um, not loose, but uh, but open, and then people don't have to feel like they have to you know prepare beforehand with a question that they're able to come in and and um, so I guess my tone is more. I want to hear from constituents more than I want to tell constituents what I'm all about. I don't, I don't think it should be a forum for us to get up there and, you know, what I think about the township. And, and if people have questions about certain, of course, there's going to be certain issues that are going to come up and do. Not to say that I want a loosey-goosey. I see it more like um, if you ever been to a, 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 a corporate meeting, a, you know, a, a annual meeting in a corporate sense, um, I, I believe in uh, arts. If you want to have a question, you go get a card. You sign in, we know who you are, and you go up and you stand there by the mic, or you have a question that you submit anonymously before that, we'll deal with those. Um, and uh, I fully believe in, I know it says it's two hours here. Um, I think that would be really hard to do. Um, but maybe a two hour hard stop in terms of a presentation type idea, and then an hour for mingle and jingle and meet everybody type of thing. But I'm just... That's just my 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 side of it. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, is I don't want it to be too formal. And I, when I'm reading what happened in the past, I get the feeling, and tell me if I'm wrong, that it was kind of a us and them type of, you know, and I know he got a little bit of that. Um, but at the other, I'd like it to be more about people coming in and, you know, even if it's like, how do I get a new garbage can? And it doesn't, no issue is too small and come in and, and talk to us. And maybe I'm just making this up because I haven't been to one before, but, uh, that's kind of where I'm coming from personally. Councillor Loka. Yeah, I, uh, I agree with those sentiments. Uh, I think, uh, it should be more of a listening uh, exercise for us, uh, as opposed to, presenting them with a lot of facts or whatever. And I, I also agree with you, uh, Councillor Walma, about you'll get a feel for the room pretty quickly. And, uh, and I love every opportunity I get just to listen. And uh, I think that would be amazing. And uh, I kind of am leaning towards having three uh, town hall meetings scheduled as well. You know, maybe one down in... Y Vale, one up in uh, La Fontaine, and one at, at Bomb Beach or the TTCC. You know, uh, spread them around and uh, and with enough notice. Uh, and this way, there's less work for staff as well. If we can, you know, make it a listening uh, session as opposed to uh, providing all kinds of information. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Councillor Haloka. Comments? Further comments? Councillor Wama, thank you, Worship. Through you, <clears throat> uh, I completely, I love, I love the idea of changing formats. Since uh, I would say, if we're going to do three, we don't have to stick to the same format every time either. Uh, again, we got to listen to what's going on. Uh, I would say there, there was definitely some benefits to having a more structured format for some of the meetings, as you can tell from uh, your door knockings and just general news uh, that uh, aggregate is a little more emotional topic for some people than others and the ability to have well I, the term of us and them 
was the ability beforehand, before we fielded all those questions, was to maybe break some of the misinformation that's out there and talk about what exactly the municipality has done, what the municipality can do uh, to uh, to maybe break some of that uh, animosity between the us and them and kind of facilitate uh, a, a more structured and uh, functional discussion. So, I mean, mm-hmm. if that's not going to be the focus, I mean, every, everyone's going to be different. I think that's that's going to be on uh, his worship and staff to kind of figure out the each one individually. But I was just going to say, I, the the ability to have that structured piece, I still see as a a benefit in certain situations. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Councilor Wama. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, three of your worship. Um, yeah, I, I, I can fully see uh, Councillor Walma's uh, point of view around having some structure. I do like the, you know, it being organic. Um, and I think that's part of our job um, as representatives of the municipality is to be prepped ourselves to be able to respond to these things and maybe debunk um, some of the rumors or myths out there as to what we can do and what we can't do. Again, our, our whole goal, and I think we're we're all in agreement, is to create a more harmonious community within Tiny. And um, I think that is, as Councillor Walma put it, part of educating the public as to what our roles are and where, you know, where our reach lies and where it doesn't lie. Um, and that's that's sometimes the uh, the 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 route um, to creating uh, less acrimony or that us versus them uh, mentality that sometimes exists out there. Thanks. Yep. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Any further discussion? Madam Clerk, what can we provide in terms of direction or or to move forward on something like this? Um, do, we, do we want us to finalize a number or rough location or? Uh, thank you, Mayor Evans. So um, what I um, could propose is that uh, if council is looking at um, going back to the three town hall meetings, that's great. Um, but um, I guess uh, direction will be required as it under the existing model. And council may want to uh, perhaps try out the existing model for the first um, one or two and see how they feel. And if it doesn't fit right for them, then it certainly can be altered. That's not a problem. Thank you very much. Councilor Bernal. Maybe we can consider um, uh, doing the the two, uh, one spring, one fall structured, and maybe the one in the summertime. I, I'm just saying if this is a, a possible to have no staff, no, just, just the five council members, perhaps one or two staff, whatever, and then the public, no no information booths. Or, I don't know <coughs> yeah, if that's possible the, uh, or not. But. Unfortunately, the five of us can't get together. Um, uh, in, together in a room, uh, as, you, as you're aware, uh, that would be a meeting of council. So we'd, we'd still be... Um, but uh, personally, I think that we we have a format that's worked well in the past. Uh, I believe uh, St- uh, Councillor Walmas said that it worked and it worked well. I, I personally think that trying that for the first one and uh, and moving forward. If I may, um, Mayor be, Evans. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. To interrupt. No, no, please go ahead. Um, just one comment. So um, just about the uh, the number of town halls per year. Um, so just so you're aware, and just for information purposes only, of course. Um, so originally, um, council did have the three, uh, but uh, it was determined that um, there wasn't as the, the attendance wasn't as great, especially perhaps maybe in the summer. Um, so that's kind of where they went down to two. So I'm just throwing out that out there for your information. Hmm. No one wants to go. Okay. Um, comments on that? Deputy Mayor? Thank you, three of your worship. I guess uh, I was going to jump in there just before and yeah, yeah. Um, propose some times, but I think, uh, you know, uh, Clerk Walton has uh, has debunked uh, one of my my thoughts around that because I was thinking if we do three, it should be a winter, spring, and summer um, kind of event. But if the, the summer is not well attended, then um, maybe it is the fall. I just want to make sure that we are taking into consideration the 40% who are seasonal um, mm-hmm. to make sure that they've got equal opportunity um, to events like this and to engage with uh with council because they can't always necessarily get up here and 
in the fall or winter, especially if they're only a three season dwelling. Um, and spring is usually a very busy time on weekends for people getting ready for their summer, uh, summer enjoyment. But um, yeah, that's a, I guess uh, there's some discussion that needs to happen on that because that changed my Councilor perspective. Councillor Brunel and Councillor Mormon, please. Thank you. So maybe that change the format for the summer one, perhaps having someone that we know that could be a, um, provide music and maybe a little dancing or whatever. Uh, uh, something, maybe something a little bit more fun, more light uh, in the summertime, I think would encourage uh, participation and just to get to know us as, as uh, people <laughs> instead of us versus them kind of thing. Thank you, Councillor Brunel. Councillor Walma. Uh, similar vein, just uh, you'll look at other uh, examples of municipalities. Sometimes they'll do coffee with the mayor or coffee with the council. Maybe if we, if we don't, we can keep it separate from today's conversation, but maybe look into doing a, a meet and greet kind of thing in the, in the summer months uh, and see if they see what kind of attendance we do get for even something as informal as that. So. Okay. Good idea. Thank you. Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Um, just um, just thinking about the summer months, we do have, uh, and I'm assuming that we are planning, or at least it's on the books, I believe, to do our community barbecue um, up in Perkins Field at some point in the summer. That might be that opportunity for the public to engage members of council at an event like that and hopefully encourage some more uh, participation in that event uh, in the summer. So that might be an option as uh, it's not a, an and or, it's, it's both, right? Um, mm -hmm. That we could potentially do three meetings, plus we've, you know, supplement it with the community uh, heroes barbecue for another opportunity for those to engage with council. Okay, thanks for the comments. I uh, was at the barbecue last year, and I, I believe all of council was there. Were they not, Councilor Woman? Yeah. So, might be a great opportunity. Okay, good. So, I guess uh, let's just get back to: uh, Do we want to, for guidance purposes, two or three? Who we want to go with? Two. Councilor Burdell's two. Councilor Loca. I like the idea of marrying up the summer one with uh, the barbecue. Okay. Uh, so uh, one in the spring, one in the fall as a town hall meeting, and then uh, combine the third one uh, with the summer barbecue, I think is an excellent idea. Okay. Thank you for your input. Councilor Walma. Three, two, two and, a two and a half, two with the barbecue. Deputy Mayor? Absolutely. Two with the barbecue. Yeah, I think we're two with a barbecue. So here we go. Maybe we'll have to cook. And your worship, as you're, we've decided on, you on a number of two plus the barbecue, uh, but I do want to just make sure we flush out the expectation of, uh, of staff for these. <clears throat> it has been traditionally re the requirement that senior management team were required along with other staff to be at the meeting. So uh, if we're going with the structured format, then that would probably have to stay the same, that we would need senior management uh, to, to commit to being at those, which obviously to their best of their ability would. I just wanted to make sure that is a difference from the original vision of what you had expected your uh, town halls to be. Yes, in discussions that CAO Lamb and I have had, and as you, I just mentioned, my, my, ex, my idea was ideal was a little less formalized um, more information gathering versus information giving. Uh, I see nothing wrong with taking a question and responding at a later date. Uh, and uh, I, you know, we're talking about work, life, work balance earlier. Um, let's see, one, two, three. I've got you know, nine people on the right here that are with us that are going to be there as well. I don't, honestly, I think we need maybe one or two people with us from a staff perspective. Uh, and any questions, there's nothing wrong with saying we don't know and we can't find out, or we do know and we can tell you, but we'll confirm later. And um, and at the same time, uh, especially with the barbecue in the middle of the summer, uh, I don't want people to have to take any undue time away from their families likewise. So I'll put that out for discussion. <laughs> Well, my view on it is uh, I think the first one we should go of uh, the way of a more traditional 
and that we have the senior management team there just to get us through the first initial one because we really don't know what we're going to be up against. And then we can loosen uh, the reins on the senior management team for the summer and the fall. Uh, so, you know, I don't want to compel them to uh, to all three, but I, I would like to, just for uh, ease of mind, uh, I would like them there uh, at the first one. Thank you. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. Councilor Walma? I was just going to say, Robert, send the uh, send the people you're mad at, and we're good to go. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Brunel, anything to add? Are we good? Oh, Deputy Mayor, I'm in agreement with that. I, I do want to lessen the burden on staff where we uh, where we have that opportunity. And as I mentioned before, I think it's incumbent upon us as council members to prepare ourselves for it to to the best of our ability and just. You know, in the spirit of honesty and transparency, if we do not know the answer to a question, we're honest about it. And but we have a, a duty and an obligation to follow up and get the answers where appropriate. So that's my thought. Good. We'll just give Madam Clerk a few minutes here and we'll clear up town hall information. Thank you so much. So I have before me recommendation that clerks report CR-03-23 regarding 2023 town hall meetings be received and that council directs staff to proceed with scheduling and coordinating three town hall meetings in 2023, one to be coordinated with the township community barbecue in the summer under the existing model with changes to be made to the model if deemed desirable. Can I have a mover, please? Deputy Mayor Miskimans. Seconder, Councillor Holoka. All in favor? Motion is carried. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Two items. Fair amount of speaking there. Okay, now we're going to move on to the proposed motion, um, item H1, um, for the Ghostman lots brought forward by Councillor Walma. Thank you, uh, Your Worship. You. Uh, and I just got to have something on my phone for this. Uh, so to start off, I'll just basically read through the emotion that was uh, that staff be directed to report back on accepting the dedication of the Gozeman lots. Uh, and this was to include the location of the existing lots, uh, any potential upfront costs, uh, potential and rough, obviously, ongoing operational costs, uh, any kind of legal that we're going to run into, uh, functionality, I guess, of the lots. Uh, do they abut existing municipal access points, existing municipal beaches? and uh, anything else from a, a corporate budget perspective. Uh, I know it's a bit of a comprehensive report, but I actually think that it's a, uh, it is a significant uh, uh, motion and it has a significant uh, impact on, uh, on Tiny and the community. Um, for those that don't, uh, anyone not know what a Gozeman lot is, I guess I should kind of explain what that is here anyway. Uh, so this is, as I understand it, uh, there's, uh, there's there going to be some, I would say this is the general concept. Gozeman lots were lots that were given to the original surveyor in the municipality. Um, basically, he didn't want them left, and we can't find or track down any of his heirs. Uh, there's been some uh, debates and discussion and controversy over ownership of them uh, for a time. Uh, we have had legal counsel come in to speak with uh, councils in the past. Um, about Gozeman lots, uh, we do have the ability to accept 
the dedication of them, as I understand. And I actually think that this should be incorporated uh, in an in-camera discussion for uh, for council in the future. Uh, but most of these lots happen to be on the waterfront. And if the township uh, is interested in protecting the the interests of uh, the municipality and beach use, I think this is a good step. It does fit within our strategic plan under the, the best strategy or beach enjoyment strategy the townships uh, discussed. Uh, previous councils have uh, endorsed um, expanding and increasing or bettering our existing uh, municipal beach inventory. And uh, I think this is a, a good way or a good start. Uh, I want a, a, a pretty good understanding of the impacts to the corporation before I would say, let's do it, which is why I'm asking for the staff report. Uh, the other component to this is when you look at even areas that we know without a doubt are municipal property, they belong to the public. Uh, if we don't, if we're not, what's the word? pointed in demarcation. Uh, you'll see from some of the areas that encroachments happen, whether they're done on purpose or whether it's done through uh, ignorance, not knowing that kind of stuff, it, it impacts the municipality anyway. Uh, we have, uh, you'll have to either remove them or deal with them from a litig uh, litigious standpoint. Uh, so I think uh, we want to start moving on things like this and uh, I'll uh, I'll leave my discussion piece at that. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Councilor Loca, please. Yeah, I like the uh, I like the attitude of uh, of approaching this, and notwithstanding, we also have the power to expropriate, if you know, uh, based on legal opinions that we have. We also have that as. I don't want to say a hammer, but, you know, uh, that should be uh, an option also raised with uh, with our legal team uh, moving forward. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Aluka. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Your Worship. Through you, I've got a, obviously a lot of experience with ghosts and lots. I've done a lot of research on this on the past, and I, I fully support uh, Councillor Walma's uh, motion here. I think it is important from a township perspective that we understand what uh, what it entails. If we do accept the dedication, what is the liability to uh, to the township? While at the same time, continuing to support the previous council's best um, program, uh, the Beach Enjoyment Strategy, as well as continuing the work on our delineation project. We know um, from hearing from the public just how important beach access is um, to uh, to folks here in Tiny. And we need, uh, I think, a concerted effort needs to be put forward for us to understand what all of our options are, where the, where the different um, opportunities lie for us um, in order to continue to uh, to expand um, the assets of the of the township as it relates to uh, to beach beachfront areas. So I'm fully supportive of this. Let's get the details. Let's understand what the budget impacts are, um, particularly, hopefully, before <laughs> Um, we uh, we get to finalizing budget. It's really important, I think, from a, a, perspective, a township perspective that we understand the costs um, and that way the public can also understand the costs associated. It's great to ask for things um, and you can have anything you want, but it always comes at a price. And the more transparent we can be on this, I think the, the better off uh, we'll be. So fully supportive of that. And thank you for bringing this motion forward, Councillor Walma. Really, really appreciate the, uh, the dedication to this. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Further discussion? Given the, uh, the, the, I know a little bit about the Ghostman lots and the, uh, of our 72 kilometers of shoreline, um, last I heard it was 19 kilometers of it, uh, potential Ghostman property. So, uh, and given that uh, past councils have done a little bit of preliminary work on it um, and the fact that, uh, yeah, we do have beach in, in enjoyment strategy, uh, it's it's incumbent upon us to know to ascertain just what is the legal legality of these lots. So I do support uh, this motion and uh, getting more information moving forward. Councillor Burnell, anything further? <clears throat> uh, during uh, through you, uh, uh, Mayor, uh, with uh, uh, Councillor Wama, um, when was this? Uh, 
When were the Gosling lots uh, handed over to them? Because uh, I know you, you, you talked about the history, uh, but for people who don't, because like I only found out about this uh, about a month ago and it's like, wow, I like, I, who knew this? Like, so, uh, but it's been uh, ongoing for quite a while. So what time, what, what period? Uh, I, see, I don't want to be the, uh, this is why I asked for the staff report. There is, uh, I would say that there's lots of variations to the uh, the answer. As far as the Gozman lots, that was the inception of the municipality. They were created at the very beginning. Uh, so that uh, the ownership aspect of them, to me, I don't know or don't remember the entire history because we have lots. You'll note that uh, as we go through, we have lots of discussions about the beaches in the municipality and uh, they are individually unique and there's lots of uh lots of complicated issues surrounding them uh but this particular one i think is something that uh we do have some background already and i think that there there are pieces of it that uh uh we're not supposed to talk about uh in uh in open session so there'll be this will be a combination piece a, a staff report uh is what i'm requesting uh for uh, for the public but we'll also uh likely have a discussion with our uh legal counsel in camera if council is uh agrees with uh moving this forward councillor Bernal <clears throat> council i believe that you know this we're discussing the discussing the motions to uh, to investigate this so you know hearsay on what is going to be found when we when this we get the report is something that should be left to a later date i believe so but good question. It's a very interesting topic and uh, something that's core to our township and uh, be interesting to find out the results when they come out. Councillor Burnell, please. Yeah, I just wanted the, the, the time of inception, uh, just that a year of approximately. 1823. Okay, so that, that's for the public's uh, pr uh, purpose. Yeah. 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 Further discussion? Recommendation before me. Whereas council considered proposed motion from Councillor Wama regarding the Ghostman lots. Now, therefore, it is recommended that staff be directed to report back on accepting the dedication of the Ghostman lots and the implication of same, including financial costs, legal implications, and functionality of lots. Moved by Councillor Wama, seconded by Deputy Mayor Miskimitz. Those in favor? Motion is carried. Thank you, Council. <coughs> Moving on to uh, communications consent items. There's a number in here. Um, these are for, uh, for your background and for your information. Uh, if you would like to, uh, there's something in a, one of those items that we, you'd like to have council uh, uh, have a motion on or, or to discuss. You're fully you know, open to do that. Uh, you can make comments uh, without having to open each item, um, but I will consider them uh, as, a, as a recommendation uh, as a group. So I'll just go around the room. Councillor Holoka, anything you'd like to comment on or, or open up? Yes, through you, Your Worship, I'm uh, I'm I'm hoping uh, Councillor Walma can assist me with uh, floating container cottages. Uh, it, I only, uh, upon reviewing uh, our agenda for this uh, meeting today, I only found out about this last night, and uh, I I'm really not sure uh, what the issue is. Uh, is it that people want? Oh, yes, I know about it. So, yeah. Is that uh, people want? to buy containers or sea cans and put them on the waterfront is is that my understanding well if in, i can sorry please go ahead is that it no i'm just going to say in lieu okay. of a boathouse or or a storage shed or it's my understanding um talking to severin that um these are being uh it's sea cans uh usually 20 foot sea can container it's put on a floating barge uh, with motor, uh, and it's certified as a boat, but then the the boat the, the the vessel itself is then being parked permanently or seasonally permanently uh, in the water uh, and being used as a domicile. So the issue is uh, the proliferation of these, uh, especially in Severn. Uh, I'm 
frankly glad you caught that because that's the one that I was going to make a comment on myself uh, in that, um, you know, the, we're into the discussion of uh, which laws have, uh, have take precedence. Uh, is it a preventive? The uh, t Township of Severn have uh, sent a letter on, uh, to the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry uh, to ask for their help in terms of um, monitoring and regulating uh, these these uh, vessels, if you will call them that. So, uh, and they seem to be gaining in popularity and the uh, they've had some pushback from uh, permanent uh, existing uh, residences to the proliferation of them. Anything else that anybody like to add? Deputy Mayor? Thank you through your worship. Um, one of the concerns of course is the spill off from gas. Um, as well as dark and uh, and gray water affecting uh, our our lakes, so it's an it's a bit of an environmental concern. Is where I've seen in every uh, document that I've read on these uh, containers um, is where that's kind of stemming from. Not to mention, I mean, when you get a whole bunch of a flotilla of them parked in front of somebody's residence, obviously that uh, that disturbs their ability to uh, to enjoy as well. So that's kind of the, some of the the other background on that and why they probably went through the the Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment. Um, now, I think there's also probably, I think there was one article where I read where um, they, they may be writing a, a letter or they have written a letter to Transport Canada too because of the shipping lanes through the waterways because it's it's all that gray area of is it municipal, is it provincial, or is it federal? Um, who who controls and has the ultimate uh, power to, to veto that or to say, no, they're perfectly fine. I think that's where it's uh, it becomes very confusing for the, for the township of Severn. Thanks. Thanks, Deputy Mayor. Further comments? Councilor Wama? Uh, thank you, Your Worship, through you. Um, just uh, if this is something that uh, Councilor Loka is interested in supporting, I would uh, also second that. Uh, and, I, and I know that I feel like I've been harping on the previous council. This is uh, Severn has also brought this letter to us in the past, uh, and obviously they're not getting any headway. So I would say new year, new council. Uh, would definitely uh, warrant, uh, if if it's something we feel strongly about as well, warrant us supporting their motion kind of thing. And we can do that for through formal resolution. Thank you, Councillor Wama. Uh, personally, I think that uh, actually Judith Cox and I are in the same committee on a county level, who's the deputy mayor of Severn, and I'm good, good friends with the mayor. Um, given we're, as far as I know, we haven't had that issue in Tiny yet. Um, but certainly that's no reason why we shouldn't be apprised of the situation. Um, if, if I'd be very happy uh, to, uh, to contact Severn myself uh, between now and the next meeting and report back uh, and uh, to get a little more background in the situation. And then if we want to put a motion together to support their, their uh, initial motion, uh, we can, or not, we can discuss it at that time. So if you'd like to table it for now, I'll, I'll be happy to contact them. And If, and if I may interject for a minute, uh, your worship. Certainly, yes. Uh, if if I could ask uh, Sean Prasad, the Director of Public uh, Planning and Development, to provide an update, because we did do a letter on this in the fall. Uh, so it'd be worth oh, really? council. Yes. Do you, Mayor Director Evans, Prasad, uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council. So uh, th this was actually a posting that I forget if it was the Ministry of Environment or Ministry of Natural Resources might have been joint that they actually put out on their Environmental Registry of Ontario and came across the council table making um, comments from municipalities on this issue. Council did pass a motion last year um, directing uh, Director Leach and myself um, to provide comments on that registry, which we did. So um, I can share that with council as far as what uh, the comments we did. I see this is uh, Severn or yeah, Severn taking it the next step and um, following that because I don't believe the ministry did anything with that information yet, um, as far as I'm aware. Um, so I can provide that background informa information. To you. Thank you, Director Prasad. Is that something we could schedule for our uh, next committee of the whole meeting? If you put a presentation together, yeah, we well we can we can definitely put that information on the agenda. Thank you, Councilor Aloka. Anything further? Yeah, just from my experience, uh, I I would think that this was a Transport Canada uh, issue initially. If you're trying to uh, make a vessel, that falls under Transport Canada. 
notwithstanding, you know, the polystyrene, uh, you know, emanating into our beautiful Georgian Bay, notwithstanding uh, Deputy uh, Mayor uh, Miskaman's comments about black water and grey water as well. But I, I think the uh, the lead on this, uh, I, I think, is a Transport Canada um, issue uh, because basically you're taking a sea container and converting it into some type of vessel. Am I correct? Yeah, basically it's like a tiny home. There's a, there's a lot of sea cans being used. I know there's a couple developments up by Councillor Burnell lives and they're making them out of sea cans. But why don't we, we'll wait for yeah. Deputy Pers or Director Prasad's report. I think this does have uh, some indirect applicability in our township already where it comes to uh, fixtures or permanent structures, albeit temporary seasonally, that are in the water on an ongoing basis and um, be them, uh, be they rafts or there's a lot of proliferation of uh, sea-do lifts and boat lifts on our beaches now. And uh, I know there's a, not gray water, but a gray area of understanding of who's, who's responsible for those and uh, the legality behind those. So, um, it's an interesting case with the, the container because it, in terms of locations, it's uh, it's identical. So we'll follow that. And again, I'll uh, I'll, I'll work with actually Director Prasad before I, John, before I call Severn and get them going. I'll uh, let's chat later this week. And uh, if we need more info, I'll be happy to go and contact them. Thank you. All right. Any other uh, within the uh, consent items? Anything else? Anybody like to bring up? Councillor Bernal, please. I believe we should speak about uh, Bill 23 a little bit. <clears throat> uh, it's a game changer, obviously, for uh, kind of a curveball thrown at uh, new council, especially new council members. Um, so getting to read all about, uh, research a lot about it uh, and continuing to research more about it. And the today's presentation from uh, Mr. Robinson was great, but it's also gonna affect item number one, uh, sorry, I.1.4, the gravel pits uh, statement was here, whereas Ontario, and this is a, a, a addressed uh, from a township of Springwater addressed to uh, Unroll Doug Ford. Uh, as a statement that says here, whereas uh, Ontario currently has over 5,000 5, licensed pits and quarries located throughout the province that are able to meet the expected near-term needs of Ontario's construction industry. Now with Bill 23, is that still the case? Um, I'd like to, oh, okay, do we need to do this uh, uh, for the Township of Tiny, we do have uh, 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 an aggregate pit that uh, wants to expand. Uh, uh, are they going to say, well, because of Bill 23, we need to do this? Like, so, you know, um, um, there's nothing that we can don't have to do today, but uh, that's something that we should uh, uh, really be paying attention to is uh, not just Bill 23, but uh, also how is that uh, the implications on the aggregate uh, industry? Uh, on the floating co containers, uh, more homes. We need more homes, so uh, we have to consider these tiny homes on on uh, barges and in, in in the water. Um, so I think that's why we're uh, what we're talking about right now is it's a uh, it's a pretty uh, uh, contentious issue that's not going to go away for sure. So that's my comments about the the matters of consideration. Oh, sorry, the uh, consent items. Sorry. Okay. Great. So did you want to put a motion together with regards to Bill 23 or, or a direction or just was it a comment? It was more of a comment at this time. Okay, that's fine. Just want to make sure. Okay, good. Uh, any further comments? Section I? Just good. again, just in that section, your your worship. Yes, COLM, please. So uh, my staff can jump in and correct me if I'm wrong, but we have already... Uh, uh, passed a motion similar to what Springwater did. We had a presentation done by the same uh, people to our municipality last fall, so that's already been already on record with the with the province on our position on that. 
And we, I do believe that the previous council has also has gone on record as being against Bill 23 and went on fish on record on those items as well. So these, what you see here is our whole series of new motions. I uh, just wanted to make this council aware that we have already gone on record with the, with all three of those items uh, with the provinces that we weren't in favor or what our, or what our official position was. Okay, thanks, uh, CIO Lamb. Um, I, I would be interested in getting copies of those. Um, I see Dave, Councillor Burnell is, uh, Councillor Romney may have it already. Um, if we're going to be guided by or, or beholden to a policy that's from previous councils, um, certainly that any item that we're con uh, considering, we should be aware of uh, any prior agreements or uh, that we're already beholden to. So, um, no rush, uh, CIO Lamb, but I wonder if we could, for the five council members to be anything that uh, previous councils have uh, sent, certainly put the township on on record for with regards to any uh, any of the uh, items under consent items here would be uh, would be appreciated. Well, I'll speak with the uh, the clerk's office and we'll make sure we can get copies when they are. Um, we do have an obligation, obviously, when uh, uh, we receive correspondence from the other municipalities to put it on the, the public agenda because they've requested us to do it. So you will see for the next few months, likely more motions of, from municipalities about Bill 23 or more motions about uh, the other thing. These have been uh, going on for a, a while. Um, and, and remember uh, that this council isn't beholden by previous councils uh, uh, positions, you have the ability to, to have your own position, but it always good to know what was sent in uh, as part of your uh, uh, pool of knowledge if you're looking at creating a different direction. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm, I'm, I'm by no means, you know, I'm, actually, the, the more uh, information we get, of course, the better we can govern and understand what is going on in other parts of the province to help us out moving forward. It's just uh, I just even with anything to do with Bill 23, if we have had a position out there, and not to say that we don't still support it, but the current council should be aware of uh, what went on in the past. So, uh, Councillor Walma, thank you, CIO Lamb. Your Worship, just on uh, uh, on that, then it, we might as well ask for council's position on Bill 3, which was the strong mayors, because we recently had a, a, a sent a letter in regarding that as well, which is also on our consent. Okay. Uh, I'm in on Monday, Monday's office day. So why don't we, uh, CIO and Olam, I'll sit down together and, and Adam Clerk and we'll go through the list and pull off what we, uh, similar type items and then we'll distribute them next week. Thank you. Good. Anything else? So I have a recommendation to uh, <laughs> get the consent items under section I, communication. Communications be received as information. Can I have a forwarder please? Thank you, Deputy Mayor Miskimmons. Seconder, Councillor Holoka, thank you. Those in favor? The motion is carried, thank you. Uh, do we have any other matters for consideration? I don't think so. This is not available. Uh, any new business? Anything any bring brought up? Please, Councillor Holoka, thank you. Uh, through you, Your Worship, um, there are a few um, official tiny township signs that have been erected uh, that are a little confusing uh, regarding private property stickers that were added onto these signs. One in particular, Kitching Lane, and I believe there's a few of them on uh, up near the 14th and 15th concessions. I'm just wondering. Uh, you know, most of the residents are confused by these signs. And I know uh, Councillor Walma has uh, maybe some historical knowledge on this. Um, we need to uh, develop a position on whether uh, to have those removed, have them altered. Some type of action is probably going to be required by us. And uh, I'd like to open it up as some new business. Okay, thank you, Councillor Holoka. Discussion? So do we know that the stickers were applied by Tiny or they were applied by somebody else? And what is, 
Are there any legal implications of these stickers or what do they, what do they say? Uh, from talking to uh, Director Leach uh, earlier today, it's my understanding that um, they were put up in error. Okay. And I think that that error needs to be rectified. And uh, he requires a direction from council to rectify that error. So you'd like to propose a motion of... Uh... That we direct council or sorry, direct staff to investigate. Sorry, a sticker issue, which is fine. Uh, Councillor Walma, can you clarify my language? It's a it's a great title. I like it. Um, <laughs> if uh, if I could, the, there was direction by the previous council uh, to leave the stickers on that were put on there uh, in, in error. Uh, I also believe that there was a, an attached uh, legal opinion uh with uh the removal of the stickers after said so perhaps uh, this could be added to our uh, in-camera discussion on the 18th and we could mm -hmm. uh, get an update on it there and then uh, pr pr uh provide some direction after we uh we have the all the facts thank you councillor walmas cao lamas uh anything to add no, thank you. Uh, we'll uh, reach out uh, and try to get that included, uh, if if at all possible, in the briefing notes, which are pretty well complete from our, uh, our our legal team on the different issues. So we'll see what we can do to try to meet next week's meeting. Councillor Loka, is that sufficient? Satisfied? Yes, it is. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Any further new business? I believe not. And now we will be going to confidential closed session. Um, Madam Clerk, I know I usually have a... There it is. Thank you. A resolution in front of me. The Council and the Committee of the Whole meetings meets in closed session to deal with the following subject matter. Uh, personal matters about an... In identifiable individual, including municipal or local board employees. Can I have a motion? Deputy Mayor Eskimans. Seconded by Councillor Brunel. So council will now go into closed session. Um, Councillor uh, Walma? Oh, no, we're not voting. Okay, and uh, we will be back uh, to uh, on camera, uh, sorry, confusing. We're going to into closed session. We'll come back into open session and close the meeting. Uh, subsequent to that, um, I have honestly no idea how long it will take. Um, so, um, all those in favor? Okay. And the motion is carried. Thank you very much for watching, and uh, thank you. Uh, look forward to seeing you again.